to Backpacker Radio presented by The Trek. I am your co-host, Zach Badger Davis. Oh, wait, I forgot the part about today is September 18th, National Cheeseburger Day. Did right? I say that before even saying who you are? Yeah. it's This is still new, so I'm on autopilot from the before times, but now that we've established <laughs> it's National Cheeseburger Day, I am your co-host, Zach Badger Davis, and sitting to my right is... I'm glad we got the most important stuff out first. I'm Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chauncey. Well, we're on the subject... There's one cheeseburger place you can only eat at in the state of Colorado. Where are you going? Uh, oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Um, oh, <laughs> I don't want to be super basic and say In-N-Out. That's pretty basic. But it's, I mean, it's an easy option. I'm also quite the fan of Five Guys. Also basic? Um, but I... I We'll say those are good options. I just like don't usually opt for a cheeseburger. So those are the two that I'll go to if I need one, which is rare. Um, I prefer chicken, like Chick-fil-A. I have given a just lot of money to that all the company. fast food joints. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I say I would get instead. Yeah. But those are my two picks. Okay. What about you? Um, I wish I had thought of this. I would probably go... I forget if it's My Brother's Bar or Brother's Bar, the one over in Low High. Uh, kind of like an old-timey bar, little divey, little underground, but they have a burger there that is the greasiest thing you've ever eaten, and it is delicious. All right, Zach yeah. Davis with the underground Denver burger scene. Yeah, uh, because both of these bars exist. There's My Brother's Bar and Brother's Bar. One's the chain that's like, I think there's one in Madison, Wisconsin, like the Big Ten Towns, and this is... The other one is the one I'm talking about. I just know Brothers Barbecue, which is not either. Oh, very different also. Yeah. Uh, reminders of any kind, Pooping in the Woods submission form. Yes. Um, we are putting out a book. It is called Pooping in the Woods, a collection of stories, working title, um, with the little asterisks. And we are collecting stories we have been going through and reading all the ones we've had submitted, and they just keep getting better. Uh, I think as you guys are listening to this, you keep hearing us bring it up, and it prompts you to want to go give us your story, um, in which case, thank you. If you're sitting there pondering, do it. Um, Because the more we have, literally the better this thing will be. And who doesn't want either a nice coffee coffee table book um, on their coffee table uh, about poop or if you're like my mom and you keep a basket in the bathroom for people to read books out of while they use the bathroom, it's perfect to go there. What better to ease that time of your life along than with quick little short stories about people nearly getting bit by rattlesnakes while pooping or yeah, you know, nothing, surprised by bears. Nothing jostles a turd loose like a giggle. Yeah. That's a fact. So we want your stories um, and we'd be very grateful to have them. Yep. Do you want to do that second part? Uh, nope. Uh, the 2024 blogger application is now open. I meant if we use your story, you get a signed copy and a sticker pack. Oh, sorry. The, the, there was another second part that I was... Yes. No, I got that. Okay. You said no. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> if we you use your story, you, you get a signed copy and a sticker pack. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are perks involved and you get to be... You get to live in infamy with having your embarrassing and or hilarious poop story featured for the universe. We're also willing to include them anonymously. I know a lot of people feel shame around this stuff. Um, totally fine. Just let us know and we won't include your name. Yeah. Or give us a fake name. Yeah, or give us a fake name. Hammer at home. Um, okay, now the thing I was going to say is today is September 18th. We are now accepting blogger applications for the class of 2024. If you are taking on a long distance backpacking trek in 2024, and you want to get involved with a large, thriving media <gasps> conglomerate. <laughs> That's a really stupid way to frame it. Uh, hit us up. The link to apply is available in the show notes. Tons of perks to being a part of our team. Um, and on that note, there's actually a few other positions that we're currently hiring for. I won't go through those, but if you want more information, the link for all of the available openings will also be included in the show notes. And we have a last item here, which is a guest request form. If there's somebody on the podcast that you would like to hear or you listening to this think that you would be a good guest, please go to the link in the show notes. Uh, we always give preference to people who are in person. So whether you live in the greater Denver area or will be passing through and we're happy to work with your schedule, we've booked podcasts several months in advance. Doing this in person is so much better than doing it via Zoom. Nobody likes to listen to 
anyone's Zoom call, myself included. So um, yeah, if you know somebody who is local or will be passing through who you think would be an interesting personality to feature in the backpacking world, hit us up. Yeah, not much to add there. It's uh, it's very helpful to us. A lot of our greatest guests come as recommendations from other guests or from listeners. Um, so if you know someone, we're willing to shoot our shot. If you're willing to shoot yours, let us know who it is and why we should reach out. That's the perfect segue to today's guest, who is, I don't know if a recommendation, but certainly a pal of a former guest who was also a recommendation of Elise. So yes. it's a crazy web that we weave here, but this is none other than John Stahl's good buddy with Peter Bergman, who if you guys have listened to the podcast for a long time, you know that episode because you laughed your ass off. Jonathan Stahls is a self-described walking artist who has walked across the United States in 2010 and more recently 500 miles from Florence, Oregon to Vancouver, BC. Jonathan is also an advocate for pedestrian dignity, which focuses on the lived experience of people who move as pedestrians through car-centric areas. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us here on Backpacker Radio. Yes, honored to be here. Thank you all. September 18th is my birthday, by the way. Happy oh, birthday. happy yeah. birthday today. <laughs> this was intentional. <laughs> yeah. So cool. What does that make your astrological sign? A uh, Virgo. What Virgo, does that Virgo. mean about you? Ooh. Ooh. Good hat game, clearly. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just I, th I don't know. There's a, like strongly opinionated at times, <laughs> passionate, needing to get out in nature, though, you know, getting the body involved, things like that. Yeah. So that's a good foundation for where <laughs> we're about to go. Yeah. Um, you've got tons of very interesting um, stories and background related to walking. But there's some other stuff I want to get to first. The, one of those things that stood out to me was that your dad played in the NFL. Yeah. That's yes. wild. Give yes. us the rundown on that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So my father was um, a, th a three-time Super Bowl player. What? Two time He won two Super Bowls ha and lost the other, but you still get three. You still get a loser ring. So he has three rings. Um, he played for the Raiders and the Cowboys and the Buccaneers. Did so he this play was, for the John Madden Raiders? Uh, no. So he was 77 to 1985. Okay. And then he, he was Cowboys first and then Raiders and then Buccaneers. Yeah. Got it. And so he, yeah. That, and, and it's, it's a funny experience cause he football ended and you know, my parents split when I was young and the divorce was difficult and he kind of just left the scene. So he didn't really engage football that much after cause it represented his marriage and different things. So he did a lot of work in nonprofit. So he still used it to raise money and, and he's still connected. Like he'll still talk about it. It's a good thing. But when I was younger, I really only engaged with him in it until I was six, mm -hmm. but I have a great memory memory of soon after he retired. I was, I went down to the Broncos stadium when they were p playing the Raiders and he would always, you know, he'd always rally people up because he always lived in Denver mostly. And so he'd always do like anti Broncos cause he was a <laughs> Raider Raider just to get people fired up. <laughs> and, um, but I, a really clear memory is being on the field with him after he retired, um, on the shoulder pads of Howie Long when they were playing hmm. the Raiders, the Broncos, and the so there's some good memories there. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Howie Long is a legend. Right. <laughs> uh, how big was you said he's a defensive tackle? Defensive tackle. So he's yeah he was six five at his peak. He's you know shrinking now. <laughs> you look <laughs> tall. How tall are you? About six four. Yeah. So he was a little. Which bit side taller. of the family does that come from? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. My sister is taller than I am. Really? What? Yes, and she's an amazing. She's a um, National team volleyball player, you know, just uh, Nebraska national champion. She's incredible. Yeah. Tall family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good uh, for walking. Yes. Long strides. Yeah. Yes. What are I these? Wouldn't know. <laughs> How magical are those Super Bowl rings when you're a kid, especially? That must feel like Lord of the Rings style. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, he was, you know, I just know it bigger than life at times, right? Like it was just, but but six. So it's six when I, when, when my parents split. And so whatever memories linger from six early, you know, I don't have a lot of them. And because of the divorce, he just disengaged a lot with football. So kind of having that in the shadows mostly, but whenever he'd bring them out, oh yeah, hmm. it was just like, what? Yeah. The weight of those things. Yeah. I mean, the sheer weight. Are you a football fan today? I, a little bit. Like I lean in, not as much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more like the, the artsy, you know, and he, it's funny. Like, I don't know if it's directly or indirectly, but he, um, he was pretty adamant about not wanting me to engage in football. He had a lot of concussions. So he's mm -hmm. currently, it's interesting because he's really involved now 
in a lot of the concussion settlements. So hmm. the stuff going on in the brain around um, CTE. CTE is a huge part of his world right now because he has a lot of like these kind of smaller episodes as a lot of players are you know, going through. And so he's a big part of that, which is really interesting. So we're tracking some of that. And, and I lean in for sure when I, you know, once in a while. Yeah. But yeah. Not as much. That's really interesting because, <laughs> you know, I've got young boys at home and I get that question often. They're too young for me to confront it now, but I get asked often from my friends about like, will I let them play football? Yeah. And to hear your dad, a professional football player, discourage you is, yes. you know, that's definitely a vote in the no direction. So are you right. going to let them play football? <laughs> If an NFL football player is, would he not let you play, or he's just strongly no, discouraging? He it? just wouldn't encourage it. Like, yeah. he, and he would, he would have clever ways of just saying, like, and I still did it. Like, I still played um, my uh, freshman and sophomore year. It, I didn't, you know, I was more of a basketball, beach volleyball dude. Like that was kind of my. So football was. <laughs> I loved the games. I could get my anger out, but the practices were too much, too hard, not for me. Um, so I left and he, so he discouraged me, especially when I started, uh, showing interest. He was like, I just need, you know, he would give me fair warnings, but he never would say no. He just wasn't like, you know, what you would think like on, on the edge of the sidelines cheering me on. Like he definitely wasn't that. Yeah. And, it, and that you could feel that. Yeah. You know? And I think what we know about concussions today is a fairly recent development. So this was before like CTE was sure. headline yeah. news. So yeah. the fact that he was tuned into that is very telling. Um, so you mentioned basketball and beach volleyball. Those were two of the other things I want to talk about was yeah. you were recruited uh, to play basketball at a collegiate level. Y yeah. So I, so at UNC in Greeley, Northern Colorado. Um, so, you know, I, I played at Lakewood here in Colorado and yeah, it just, it was a messy, um, I was getting, you know, invitations from like junior colleges and smaller schools, but you know, my dad played at UNC and so there was some cool connection there and, and it was close and it was division two. So it was a little bigger. I'm six, five, I'm really quick and, and athletic, but I'm six, five and I'm a center. Hmm. So you're not going to, you're just not going to do a lot as a six, five center. I mean, you're just, <laughs> and so I tried to be quirky. I couldn't, I really couldn't get a full scholarship to a bigger school. But UNC just said, come up and visit. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to have you redshirt and just kind of support the team for the first year. Um, and then we will scholarship you in and you'll be on the team. So they kind of they kind of laid it out. And I just trusted that. I didn't sign anything. I trusted it. I trusted the coaches, um, trusted what the conversations we had and the practices that I did go to. And it was maybe two months into my first year. Um, the head coach pulled me and another player aside. And this is after I had already just said no to other smaller, smaller opportunities. Um, and he's just like, sorry, gentlemen, uh, we have two players that are um, coming in from Australia who are transfer players and we're just not, gonna, we're just not able to keep you. Oof. I mean, two months into the semester, you say no to things. You give, I gave so much of my time to basketball training and year round basketball stuff. And it was a blow. So I, that's when I just, I, I finished the year. It was, a, <laughs> it was a messy year. Um, and then I moved to California and, and picked up <clears throat> by chance, picked up volleyball and started playing hmm. beach volleyball. Yeah. And the, the sports skills certainly aren't lacking cause you were also then semi-professional at beach volleyball. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, my, um, I just fell in love. I met these guys at the gym who were beach volleyball players. They said, Hey, come down and play with us. And I just, it was everything. You get down there and train it. Like this was outside of San Diego, San Diego County, North County. And I just, every morning you'd go and train and play, you know, you carne asada burritos, you got the <laughs> beach right there. I mean, it's just so, all the things. And so I just loved it. I loved how the sand cushioned every move. Like I felt my full body, um, is this much, Solana Beach, Encinitas? This is Encinitas, so okay. Moonlight Beach, yeah, okay. right there. Yeah. And, and there were a lot of older, older players, older guys in their 70s and 80s who were there all day, retired. And, and I just, I, I love the relationship of kind of the finesse of volleyball, but, but, you know, getting your body in the sand and throwing it around, but the skill of placement of the ball and the, the, just the full body workout, especially the idea of just two people on the side of a court and you have all these jobs to do. I loved it. And so I would just, I would, 
I built my life around training from these older players mm -hmm. who didn't really come from the big kind of blocking spiking game that it is now where you have a lot of indoor players going to the beach kind of old school beach volleyball is bigger courts and a lot of skill sense around how to throw, you know, use the full court and drop balls all over the short and the far. And so I learned from these guys, um, but I didn't have formal um, beach volleyball training in terms of like just the, the, the things that a lot of the indoor players, the technical skills of hitting a ball and blocking. But I had basketball smarts, sports smarts, and it just, it just all clicked after a couple years and I found a really good partner. His name was Tomo from Japan and we just we trained all day and then we by by year three and four we moved our way up to what's called triple a which is the top of triple a is kind of the top of the open leagues and then once you're triple a you start you start uh playing in what's the avp and you start working up what's called the qualifier hmm. and then there's sometimes side leagues that are not the avp that will pick up players for their tours and so we were picked up on one of those tours which where we were paid and then we'd make money, you know, winning the triple A's and then some of the qualifiers. So that's where it's like semi pro. You're kind of in that you're making money, but you're not making a lot of money. You're grinding. You got You still got to have six jobs, mm -hmm. especially in Southern California. Yeah. Whereas the top players are making, you know, they're more full time. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> it's well, wild. so it's like another life ago. It's yeah. so long ago. <laughs> so you being six, five, I assumed that you were just going to be at the net just blocking everything yeah. but it's funny that it's a different style of volleyball totally yeah yeah like i would still you know i'd still have the blocking game but it was so my game was so much more based on court sense and shots and placement uh, because i learned from from guys that were <laughs> 85 88 years old hmm. and that's that was another signal to me they often talk about it more now beach volleyball being the second healthiest sport next to swimming because you just every move you make is cushioned by sand hmm. and so to see so many older adults like 80 years old diving for a ball i mean it's like what yeah especially <laughs> when you contrast that with football yeah and, oh yeah. right yeah totally <clears throat> so how much of your life was portrayed in the movie point break oh my <laughs> well i'm trying to think <laughs> yeah i mean the significant i mean you look at those tournaments absolutely definitely yeah yeah that's a wild life. Yeah. It, it is. When yeah. um <laughs> when did walking come into play with all this stuff? Oh yeah. It was so that volleyball was two thousand like the the height of it was like two thousand four, two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand seven. Um in between all that I went out to Ireland for a year. I lived in Ireland for a year. That's a whole nother story. Um, just to do some unique things and take a take a year off and I came back from that, um, pretty shooken up because some things had been opened up in me around just stuff I had to stuff that I wanted to work on on the inside so I'm gay I'm queer and coming out was really hard like I grew up in a complicated environment I moved every two years growing up and so I had I was a new student in all these schools I'm a really sensitive person I'm an artist I've always been a drawer like I just and and being gay and queer in rural environments especially on the east coast <laughs> is you just you don't talk about it especially back then um it just wasn't something and i i didn't have a lot of support so it was it was kind of a brewing storm of things and i didn't really know where that was going to go so after volleyball um i just was like God, volleyball is stressing me out we're not we're not breaking qualifiers it's not becoming like a full-time thing i'm grinding so hard and there's this thing that got triggered and opened in ireland that i i have to figure out i don't know what it, i don't know what that means so I got to relocate. So I came back to Denver and I started finishing school at Metro State University, which is where I met Peter, which was so such a wonderful connection. Um, but that's when uh, at Metro State, I just I was I was seeking what would this next thing be? What, what do I need? I need an experience that's going to shake the storm. It's going to open up the real things. And, you know, I don't know what that is. And so I was stumbling upon um, a, a book sale at the Auraria Library at Metro State in downtown Denver. And there was a, um, it was 20 cent books and all the books are just kind of laid out. And I see Walk Across America by Peter Jenkins just kind of staring at me. And, uh, and so I just, for whatever reason, I was like, what, what the hell is this book? I grabbed it. Um, I sat on this like funky leather chair and I had so many classes and tests that, <laughs> that week and canceled them all. I sat in that chair the whole and the whole day until the library was closed. I'm reading this book. I'm getting teary-eyed. I'm getting even angry because this. I'm seeing this young man just like 
just walk into the world just with all, like I just want like all the reasons that Peter Jenkins kind of moved in that way around the same time into the wild I saw that movie that messed me up um, I was actually it's a funny story I was on a I was on a, like one of my first like I'm gonna try out try coming out and I'm gonna go on a date with a guy and I'm gonna see what this is like and it was that it was playing at the Mayan this was just alongside of finding walk across America in that book and it was his birthday, you know, and this movie, I am just like, I'm sweating, I'm panting that, you know, I'm big in these little seats. I'm just like moving around, slithering in the theater. I'm just so uncomfortable because it's having such an impact. Like I so badly want to start over from a different slate. I want to be more honest. I want more simplicity. I want nature to be my teacher. I want... I want to redo the things and this character who is just going off into the into the into the wild I, oh, I was a mess and so after that movie <laughs> I'm like I'm shaking I, I tell my you know the date bye <laughs> bye I don't even know happy birthday <laughs> and I just I go to my apartment I take all my clothes off I grab my guitar I th pick up my microwave throw it on the ground and break it because for whatever reason <laughs> the microwave are bad. was a threat <laughs> <laughs> and then my laptop i'm about to knee snap the laptop and i'm like put it back <laughs> and i sit down i light all the candles and i just cry and play mm. the guitar for hours mm. and and it was in though it was in it was in that like it was like a three four week period and this was just like this was 2008 and I was just like, I have, what am I gonna do? Cause this is, I could, I gotta listen to this. And so that's when um, I started planning this walk across the US. Cause I was like, that's it. That, I think, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never, I've never done any backpacking or long distance hiking anything. And um, so I just started making a plan and I, you know, and, and that's kind of how it unfolded. And, you know, Mar I ended up taking off on that walk in March of 2010. Um, so it took me a while to kind of get the plans, but I had the plan. I knew I was going to do something. So I started talking to different people. And, um, it's funny when I, as, as a, as a backpacking, uh, podcast, I mean, when I started, when I left on March, I wasn't obviously talking to the right people because <laughs> when I left, uh, on March, uh, 1st in 2010, my backpack weighed 95 pounds, <laughs> y'all 95 pounds, one of those old Jansport, like external frame oh yeah you know he's in bungee not, cords to oh, keep everything you on. just you know not all the way cheryl strayed but but close yeah very very close did you ever have a <laughs> second date with that fellow no no he, uh <laughs> we actually ended up staying connect i apologized you know later was like look sorry hot mess over here let me <laughs> let me unpack what happened the rest of the night but like so he was really cool and yeah. so we've actually stayed you know loosely connected but uh -huh. I want to back up a little bit because you mentioned that your time in Ireland triggered something to kind of like jostle sure. this free. Was there a particular moment or was it just yeah. timing or what was it? You know, so for me, it was I grew up. Um, oh, so many things. It was it was I would actually say it was just really complex religious stuff. I was a part of. So my mother um, for most of her life as, as an, was an alcoholic. And so I, that was a huge complicated thing. We moved every two years. So I was a new student in 13 different schools up until 16. And it was, it was just really messy. I never knew how I was coming home to. So I grew this like, you know, a lot of my coping was never be the reason there is conflict because there's so much chaos and conflict. So don't be the reason there. So I suppressed everything. I was a peacemaker, just be nice. It was a time bomb waiting to go off, you know. And, but then also that just was, was all wrapped up <coughs> In the sexuality stuff you know i knew i knew i was gay queer when i was in seventh grade it was just it was obvious um but i buried it i buried it i, I had girlfriends i i, I just it, this was it was a non-option and i had nobody to talk to so ireland was tricky because it was connected to a church that i had connected to in san diego that was helping me to just it was giving me tools and helping me let go and work through things with my mother primarily like, how do I handle, how do I work? How do I go a little deeper? How do I talk to her? How do I pray or try to let, like, how do I, you know, I just was seeking, we had church experience growing up that was complicated. My dad wasn't religious, my mom really was, but it was all, 
it just it was weird and so then this was a church that I connected to in California connected to that was this invitation to go to this thing in Ireland where you're like learning things connecting it wasn't like save the people of Ireland but it was it was adjacent <laughs> and it was also adjacent to like you're gay and let's 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 pray harder let's pray it out hmm. it wasn't all the way there but it, it was adjacent it was kind of the undertone so it was really difficult like i started opening up because you're in spaces where you're you're, you're being invited to open up and talk about things but then quickly you're being told and shaped and held in a space that you know you're you're wrong you're fundamentally hmm. wrong this is wrong you need to be healed it's a discipline issue it's not it's you know all that stuff that comes from that yeah. mindset and you know i just i i i was juggling a lot of things and I, I was leaning into that but i didn't trust it and and so i came back from a year of that just like confused frustrated not buying it but not trusting myself either hmm. and it and it was the impetus of like who are my teachers what do i trust mm -hmm. how do i how do i learn to love who i or at least try like what is the ground i'm standing on you know was there ever a part of you like during that that's like yay like this is like you know buying into them saying this is something that you can cure or were you just from the start like this is hogwash you know but sure i'll go along with it yeah i i would say somewhere in the middle because i just didn't trust myself i think for my whole upbringing i was adapting and fitting in like never be never be conflict just fit in like new schools tease i was teased a lot as a kid like just always like fit in fit in be nice be nice keep the peace keep the peace just do you know so it it really felt like like that it was there was a vacancy in my own agency and i was getting filled with you know it was i was really grateful that my dad had a different like a different perspective i was grateful that there were a couple just a couple gay queer people that I didn't really know, but that I at least observed in my life. Um, but I just didn't have a lot of teachers. And, and I think that's what, you know, back to that, the question of why walking, like it was like I, when I saw what Peter Jenkins, when I, through that book, when I saw that these characters who just were just going out to walk. And for me, it was like walking to heal and to like, I'm just like, I got to walk some shit out. <laughs> I don't, if I'm going to survive, cause Ireland was also, um, where, and I write about this in the book, it was also, there were periods of uh, suicide attempts. Like I was, I was on that edge. Like I would wake up in the night, like in terror, like I'd rather be dead than be gay. Cause I don't even know what gay means. I don't know. How does that play out? That's like the ultimate conflict. So if I'm gay, my mom's going to hurt, her system's going to trip. So she's going to bounce. And then I'm responsible for that. And I mean, all this attachment complex stuff was compiling. So I was like, this is the easier route and I have a lot of suicide in my family lineage and so I, it was interesting that suicide had not really been on the table prior to Ireland when it was all coming out it just kind of showed up and so now in my older year like older years I'm like I'm observing that looking at my family like wow this is lineage stuff is tricky stuff mm -hmm. how it kind of finds its way yeah that's got to be so tough to bury that for so long and then once you open up and reveal that to be told that you're wrong I, that's got to be the biggest mind fuck that that right like you finally feel like you're in a space you're being you're being guided into like be open like just be be open share build try and to just like feel that like that turn against it to be told you're wrong it's not of god oh but in those times, when I was, when I, I'm so like, I'm so vulnerable in that state. Like I was just so, I was seeking teachers. I was seeking guidance. I was, I was a mess. And, and so that, I mean, that's really, that was the, that was the loudest ache for the cross country walk. It was like, I, I want new teachers. Mm. I want the trees. Part of the, when I, you know, I share about this in the book, but part of the, um, part of what guided me uh, very gently out of not um, being successful in I shouldn't say successful it's not really but just from going through the suicide attempt fully was um, it was the wind in the trees in these Irish trees on this on this road in the middle of the night that just the way they would blow and the way the moon would kind of hit with them 
and it would take me out. I'd notice it. I'd feel it. And I'll just never forget, like, slowly walking towards that, just kind of contemplating whether or not I should really do this, but kind of not conceptually thinking about, oh, the trees are kind of saving me right now. Like, I would never have even, but that, in, in looking back, it's always been like, yeah, that's, there's something to that. And, um, you know, and, and obviously on this long t- walk across the country, it just, it totally affirmed that. In, in more ways than one, yeah. We had a um, an episode in the past that we did with someone who had detailed a suicide attempt that they had made, mm, and mm, they had mm. one of those like otherworldly experiences where they had heard a voice, you mm. know, like right in the defining moment. Mm-hmm. Did you have anything otherworldly like that happen in your attempts? That was kind of like, whoa, that's crazy. No, no. I, I, other than I th- the main thing for me was just the wind in the trees because my, you know, it, the, the, the real edge that I got to, it was twice and it was in Ireland when I was, um, you know, I was standing kind of on the edge of a busy road. It was like, this is going to be quick. It's at night. I'm gonna, it's just going to take a couple steps, wait for the large truck. Um, so it was fascinating. It's, it's fascinating that that was my solution, you know, at that age and all the layers that get to that but it was literally like the wind like I just think about what what took me off of that ledge physically and it was um it was it was nature in that way but no no words nothing like overly overly um yeah verbal or or anything out but just it was the wind in the trees yeah so you mentioned being reluctant to come out because your mom is very religious and um you weren't sure how she would respond to it. How did she respond to it? So um, chapter six, one of the, of this book, the, at the beginning, I detail that exact story in the chapter. It's called walking is vulnerability um, because walking became my main medicine. I mean, I was seeking medicine. I was seeking teachers and um, on that cross country walk, it became the medicine. Like I, I'm like, this is, I'm feeling so much better. I'm more open. I'm more grounded. I'm more connected to people outside of walls. I'm connected to the nature beings and teachers. I'm connected to my body and my breath and my anger and my love and my sadness and all the things like I'm, (laughs) I love it. I need it. Um, and so when I was coming out to her, um, it was interesting. This was before my cross country walk, but something about movement, even though I didn't, I didn't have the words or the conceptual forms. I just, I couldn't see myself sitting inside of the house telling her. So the beginning of chapter six is basically kind of a detailed story about how without fully knowing what it was doing, or at least not knowing what it would do, but just kind of trusting movement and being outside, um, it kind of details the, uh, the coming out to her. And, um, and she was, she was okay. Mm-hmm. She was, loving she was confused you know she there was a lot of back and forth it was incredibly uncomfortable but the movement was so helpful and I I don't fully understand that I do more now but then I just you know looking back on it like the fact that we were slowly kind of walking through the neighborhood unpacking it versus sitting in a room where you got walls and across from a table and you're kind of more in your head and I think you know movement distributes things in the heart and the body and I we're next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, all this stuff is happening. And, you know, and she just, you know, by the end, she's like, I, I don't know what to do with this, but I love you. I'm, 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 I'm here. And that was huge. And my mom is amazing. She's, I mean, talk about uh, shifting and coming to different places. We're so close now and we've always been close, but um, there were some definite edges. Uh, but yeah, it was an affirming, it was an affirming walk. Yeah. Do you have any do you have any tips for how someone can approach that conversation themselves because I imagine it's probably Mm -hmm. like just getting out those first few words is probably really difficult totally that's a great question yeah one of the things that I just find you know and more and more now that it's just become a lot of my artwork and life and hosting a lot of practices and trying things on but even just back to like trusting that movement an unhurried movement and protecting time to be in movement, even if it's doesn't need to be a long, it doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be in a certain, like it can be just slowly moving around a park. It can be slowly kind of walking around a tree in the front or backyard. But when you're moving with someone that you're trying to share something really 
may be terrifying or hard or vulnerable or confusing or difficult or very personal. Um, you know, I sometimes I I like to preface like I, I encourage pre facilitation a little bit, like almost like, hey, are you open to uh, me just freely and openly just sharing some things? I don't even fully understand them. I don't even know if the right words are going to come out. I don't even know. I may just burp and <laughs> like ache and cry and no words may come out. But can I just, are you open to just listening for a little bit as I fumble with what feels real for me or, or hard for me? And so, and then just seeing if they can show up to that as a test, not a test, but just an invitation. And then like we can kind of unpack it a little bit after. Um, so some of that pre-facilitation, I think, can be a really helpful tool because you're giving yourself permission to not be, to not have it all figured out, to not have the right words, to be okay with emotion that comes up when you start opening things up. And you're preparing the other person too to like not be, to not need or put pressure on you to say the right things or certain things. You're like, you're preparing a space a little bit. And then I think along with that, I just encourage movement because you're, from a neuroscience perspective, from a brain health perspective, I mean, when you're moving for, after just 20 minutes of movement, there's a great book out there that I quote a lot in here called um, In Praise of Walking, and it talks, it's, a, it's by Shane O'Mara, and it's a neuroscientist, and it just, it's just filled with affirmation around why we need to move in an unhurried way for all the reasons from a neuro perspective. And after 20 minutes of unhurried movement, you are literally creating new neural pathways. So when you're moving your body at, a, at, at its most regulated pace, at, you know, you're, you're, because with walking, you're, you're doing so much complete, all your systems are all talking to each other, blood is flowing, all this stuff is happening in the body that takes things out of the brain, down into the legs and the feet. And <coughs> it's just, it, it really opens things up for someone to hold new things mm -hmm. and it allows you to have you know new ways of seeing it in yourself so you know it's not just from i think in theory in theory it's actual like chemical and neuro it's like the brain is working on your behalf mm -hmm. you know so you mentioned the thing that prevented you from following through with the suicide attempts in Ireland was the wind in the trees. Yeah. And then obviously you had the inspiration to do this hike. Did you have instances of knowing that nature and movement was healing for you prior to this hike? Or was it just sort of something that you intuited? Like, is this, were you going out on extended hikes and trying to work through your things or was, um, your, Called ADT. I don't know how sure, else to yeah. describe it. Your ADT hike. <laughs> yeah. Um, was this your first extended attempt at using nature and movement as healing? Uh, very much the first. Yeah. I. I mean, I. There were. I just. It just wouldn't have nearly been as intentional. Like there were things that I was curious about. There. My dad took us on the occasional like hike in Boulder or up. Like we'd, we'd do things with him, but it was never. I just never had that kind of relationship to it. Um, I was mostly, you know, I, I, it was ball sports. It was basketball and, and beach volleyball like I, that. And it really, that was helpful for me. Exercise was always something that was definitely a medicine source. Um, but nature, not, not, not really. And so this was really a full on and that. And so when I did this walk, I was 20, 26, 27. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a lab of learning for me. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the particulars of the hike itself. Yeah. So. You start out with the rough intention of doing the American Discovery Trail. Yeah. And um, we were chatting beforehand, but pretty early on, you deviated. <laughs> yeah. Walk us through that. It was really, what I'm really grateful for the ADT is it gave me the container to dream. Like it just helped me dream. I had no idea what, it, what I was doing. I didn't have people that I could really feel like I could connect to until I made the plan and I started reaching out to some folks. Um, so the ADT, when I literally, I was typing walk across America or route America, you know, just on Google or whatever it was at the time, Yahoo. Um, that's what came up. And so I just downloaded all at the time, like 242 pages or whatever it was. It was not that long, but it was a lot. Like the packet was <laughs> of just all the routes, 6,000 miles. So what is it? 6,200. 
and it was going up and down and around. And um, I wasn't sure if I was going to do the whole thing. I just, I printed it all out. What I knew is I only had a thousand dollars to my name. So I might have to work along the way. I may not do this all in one go. Um, what I did have experience in was working in fundraising and in nonprofits. And so um, a funny connection to this podcast, I was, we were talking earlier. So Teresa Martinez is a dear friend of mine, CDTC. I used to do crowdfunding stuff. And um, I was a part of the, um, the team that kicked off the very first crowdfunding campaign with Teresa and the CDTC. So she's a dear friend. Um, but I'm connecting that I had, so I had crowdfunding experience. I had a little bit, so I created this proposal because I wanted to, to move with a cause or an organization that could help me kind of get out and meet people because I knew that would be helpful for me and, and promote something that I care about. So Kiva is an organization that helps to support microloans and small businesses all over the world. Um, it's, you basically give a, a lend $25 to a small business here in the US or somewhere in the world. They slowly pay you back and you can reuse that 25 over and over and over again to help people get on their feet or to fix a bit their business when a natural disaster comes through. It's really cool. Loved it. So I sent this. <laughs> it was a, I don't know how heavy it was. It was probably, I think it was $25 to send to California to their office. I sent a manila envelope with that whole ADT route <laughs> printed in it with a cover letter. And I just said, y'all, I want to walk across the country for health, for all the reasons, to heal some things, to walk some shit out. I, I like to promote things I care about. Um, would you be interested in being in helping to sponsor and support if I promote Kiva along the way? And I got a phone call a week after she received it. She said, this envelope is huge. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do with the envelope. Um, but we're really excited and we're in, we're down for it, which was really motivating. Like my heart just was like, oh my gosh, this is meant to be. And so we kept talking, we kept talking. Long story short, I uh, start the walk and um, I start walking from the Delaware coast. And, uh, and within a week or two, I was on the Potomac River. This is a segue, but it's connected. Um, I was on the Potomac River in Maryland and it was flooding and it was intense. And, but I, all of a sudden my phone started like, and I had one of the first smartphones, y'all. I had the, the Android that still had the typing and, it was slow, <laughs> you know, but it was one of the first ones. I was grateful. And it just started bing, 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 bing. Kiva was like holding off on sending their, an email. I guess they had like at the time 14,000 or 7,000 people on their list. They were kind of like, let's just make sure he's for real. Let's give him a couple weeks. So I just thought, all right, they're cool. Like they're supporting me. Great. I still have $1,600. So I'm back, probably going to have to work as I go. It's going to take me longer. They sent out an email saying this dude's walking across the country and he's telling people about what we're doing. Throw him a few bucks. And within a week after that email, I had a budget. On, I had a little, one of those old weird thermometers for raising money on the website. And within a week, I had $10,000 on there. $10,000 was funded. Wow. Wow. So I had funding for food and staying in the occasional hotel. And I had a dog with me. So supporting him and oh my gosh. So I it was another like, you know, three weeks into this walk, like having that affirmation anyway. Um, so are you having to pay that back? Is this like no, how you were saying the loan part? Right. So what the difference was they, we agreed that I would create what was called a lending team and I'd go into towns and talk to people in the newspaper mm -hmm. and I would organize and try and encourage people and kids. I'd stop in schools and talk to, you know, students and stuff along the way um, and encourage them to sign on and join our lending team. So they just said, we want you to join, ha help people, encourage people to join. So anytime then somebody's like, how can I help you? How can I support? I'm like, I'm good. I have resources. Um, s join Kiva, join our lending team and give $25 to a new business. So by the end of the walk, um, we were the Kiva walk lending team. We had about 500 members and we raised a uh, half a million wow. for um, businesses all over the world. That's awesome. It was so cool. Do they give you, um, I, I'm sure this is probably very hard to do, but do they give you feedback or just info from Kiva back to you on like what businesses you've helped or mm. is it just the general businesses? No, what's really cool about it is you can track. So um, there's your, your whole, you're choosing the specific individual or family or team or, or business and you're, you're basically choosing who you want to give to. Um, so you can search by 
is it farming? Is it uh, is it a grocery store? Is it by country? Is it by is it is it women, men, non-binary? Is it is it a family? I mean, you can get really specific with your searches around who you want to lend to. It'll also so and then you can track it almost like like kind of like receipts. You kind of track who you've given to. So our lending team could track all the different families that loans were going to. Wow. And it you and you think about all of that recycling. You know, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Doesn't it also give you how much support your $25 actually provides? Because I remember doing this mm-hmm. way back and I was supporting some, uh, not to pat myself on the back, some woman-owned, woman-owned business somewhere in Africa. Mm-hmm. And I was just blown away by how far 25 yeah. USD went. And I, maybe Botswana, I forget exactly where it was. But I found that to be a very rewarding part of it to be like, this is not that much money to me, but this is a huge help to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very dependent on the country and the need and the family, but it is like $25 can go a, re- a really long way in certain places for sure. The other thing I like too, is they just get really specific, especially in where, when communities are in crisis, like we need new dryers because our laundromat was wiped out because of the hurricane. Mm. So you're like, this loan is for 10 new you know, dryer washer combos. And so you think about like, it's $10,000, you get this many people jumping in, you know, whatever it is. Um, I like how specific they get to around some of that. And they just have a lot of good people working on just making sure it's healthy and communities are being like, just healthy relationships um, and all of that. So it was, it was a, it was a great partnership. It was cool. Yeah. So how did you pick your route? You start off with <laughs> yeah. the idea of the ADT, you deviated. Yeah. Like what does your day to day look like in terms of deciding where you're going to go next? Yeah. So this has become kind of my, I mean, it's my medicine. It's my adventure. It's very connected to the route, you know, and how I planned it. Even with this one, we just got back from my partner and I just walked from, you know, Florence, Oregon to uh, uh, Vancouver. Um, but it, it be, I just found myself and this was not a part of the plan. You know, my plan was just to lean into the ADT and see what happens. Um, I did at the beginning just think I want, I want to lean into local people. Like I want to, I want to meet people. I don't need, I don't necessarily want to be a, around people all the time, but I want to lean in. And I found myself just loving getting into these little small towns and talking to folks, meeting people on their ran- like as they're ranching, as they're outside. And so I, I honestly would literally, like I would literally plan to go to local libraries and I talk to local people and I say, hey, I'm trying to get, this is the next bigger town so I can fill up or I can get, you know, into, you know, just to get a shower or whatever. And, and, and it, I just loved how that started to, how it started to unfold around these, all these different uh, gifts, food, drop offs, people just loving on you, asking you questions. Like it just started to happen the more I would kind of step into asking. And I just, and it would happen at the beginning because the beginning of the ADT, you're kind of you're doing some road walking. You're doing you're not like right on trail all the time. And I was leaning in to connect to people a lot, like asking questions about where what do you think is the best route? You know, if I was to deviate off the trail or whatever. And and I'd get some interesting suggestions. And um, day, I talk about this at the beginning of the book, too. But day three, you know, I had somebody it was my first night not having a place to stay. Um, and this was still when I was holding on to ADT. You know, I was like, I wasn't sure. Um, but I had somebody literally run out of the woods in the rain, a woman just seeing us on the road, you know, all the, all the trail magic stuff, all the trail angel stuff, just curious about what we're doing, about the dog. Can I walk with you for a bit? The rain is pouring. I'm like, what is this woman doing in her work heels or work shoes in the middle of the rain next to the high? I mean, it was shocking because I was still carrying so much distrust in my body. I was still, I was like, ah, this is, this is scary. I don't know what I'm doing. Keep going, keep trying. Cause the first two nights I had places to stay, people who were connected to Kiva who would pick me up and like I had all that. So this is the first time I'm like putting that tent down and it was scary for me. Never done anything like that. And here's this woman running out of the woods, just like, hey, what you doing? What do you, why, you know? <laughs> and then she, we're, we're we're building trust as we're walking in the rain, getting splashed by cars. And after just 15 minutes, she's like, do you need a place to stay? I'll make you dinner. I'll come pick you up. When's your, where's your route going to finish? We went to a shopping center. We met there. She picked us up, brought us back to her house. Um, it was the most incredible, wonderful trust building, magical. We just had such a good time. She had 
uh, what was it? Seven cats and two dogs. I mean, it was a mess and it was awesome. <laughs> My dog is a blue healer husky. He was neurotic, whining, barking. The cats were losing their, I mean, it was a <laughs> mess, but it was awesome because she was just so, and she had never done anything like that before. So for both of us, it was just like this kind of magical opening of hearts and stories. And I mean, I was literally crying leaving her house that morning because I just had been, it, it just opened a whole world of trust for me. And so from that point on, it was like, I want more of that, mm -hmm. you know, not just, you know, I, I want to find it. I want to stumble into it. I want to lean on it. I want to, I want to get lost in it. Like I want I, seven cats. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, just all of it. So that there are so many stories connected to that within those first couple of weeks. And that's when I really discern, like, I want those experiences more than I want um, maybe needing to stick to a trail. And so that's when I started just, I said, all right, I'm getting off the ADT and, or just like kind of releasing that. I might pick it up in different segments as I go West. I, and then I reshaped it to fit the timeline. I knew I didn't want to go. I didn't want to continue walking if I didn't have to through winter. So my aim was to just get to these bigger cities. So my new route was based on just cities as kind of segments. So like my first city was DC. My next city was, uh, was Cincinnati. My next one was St. Louis. My next one was Kansas City. Next one was Pueblo. Next one was um, the border of ne Nevada, Utah. Oh my God, walking Utah, Nevada. So, I mean, just the best. Hmm. Walking into um, Sacramento and then into San Francisco. And those cities were kind of like the hubs. Kiva's headquarters is in San Francisco. I wanted to finish there. And then everything in between was talking to people librarians just loving like loving on me in the journey helping me out with routes talking to ranchers and getting permission to walk through their properties um you know and i was talking to people about kiva so i'd get in the newspaper quite a bit and i'd talk to schools and then you know like so and so's parents sees me driving along and you know throws a lasagna out the window <laughs> don't throw it <laughs> but, you know and i'm i'm you know picking up lasagna in the <laughs> dust it's awful but it's amazing um I have some great poop stories too. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Usually I'm like, we have yeah. to do I save them <laughs> no, you for no. your book? You dive right in. We can repurpose this. Mm. But just so many good poop stories. Oh my God. I don't know why I went there. I think I was thinking about the. You made, you made eye contact with me when you said it, which is a little weird. <laughs> you made eye contact with me. I didn't mean to. That's, That's hilarious. okay. Tell me about your poop. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I'm, I think I've made the connection because I the way it felt to eat lasagna, and this was in Missouri, in kind of the kind of musty cornfield, it reminded me of how awful and intense my poop experience was in Kansas. Um, <laughs> That's so quite I the connection. That quite maybe, the compliment to that mom. <laughs> that maybe is the thread. I know it really has nothing to do with the mom, but it's... Um, so anyway. What, ha what happened in Kansas? Yeah, quick poop story. All right, quick poop story. I So Kansas... I mean, wa so mostly road walking. I mean, I absolutely got off on trails. I tried to do rural roads as much as possible. I had the backpack uh, up until, um, when did I, uh, there was a point, oh, I had, the, I had the push cart in the desert and then I had backpack. So I'm going through Missouri and Kansas. Missouri was by far one of the hardest states to walk through because of the humidity and the ticks. One day um, I picked off 65 ticks. <laughs> off of Kanoa, 22 off of me. We had a bag. I, I'll never forget the video of showing all the ticks to the people in YouTube. Um, Is there a, a reason you kept them? What's that? Is there a reason you kept the I, ticks? I glory. just, glory. <laughs> I, couldn't I couldn't believe how many. Yeah, like people, it sounds like a Peter art project or something. <laughs> yes, like it just people have to be interested in this, yeah. or at least I'm fascinated by it. Is this a thing? You get into town, hey, you want to see my bag of ticks? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. Can I sleep on your floor? No, that's exactly right. It literally felt like it was glory is the right word. Um, uh, but so, so coming out of, so getting out of Missouri, Kansas now, a lot like open fields, but a little more even like more spread out than, than Missouri. So further distances. And I, you know, I usually had a pretty good radar on when the bowels were talking. Like, I'm like, I can feel y'all coming. I know, you know, like I went, you know, I just, I had a good, we had a good system. We were talking to each other. We knew if we had, if we had a longer stretch between a place where I thought we could go, 
we got it we got it done and we figured it out before so we had a good system this day was just longer than i thought more stressful than i thought hotter than i thought so i don't know if it was the stress that forced it but it was it was one of those you know those moments where it's just it's it's slowly creeping and you're like ah there is nothing but cornfields for as long as i can see um, but these cornfields are active. Like you got people like, a all the cornfields are being like this is har- people are harvesting things, people are working things. It's not just like cornfields without people. It's cornfields with people. So it's complicated. Like yeah, I could probably hide, but I'm six five, <laughs> and my dog is a husky wolf, and he is because of his husky, he's extremely vocal and has an and has intense separation anxiety. Mm. So if I'm so I'm this starts to happen when you're when you're not in sync with your valves as you're used to, which is what was happening, I'm like, oh, oh we're losing com- communication. Like it's, <laughs> it's trying to take the conversation. It's trying to be alpha right now. And I gotta, now I need to start looking around. Cornfields have a lot more people. This is uncomfortable. This isn't gonna, this, is, this may not work. So I, I'm gonna try, I'm pushing back down. I'm like, not right now, <laughs> not right now. And so we keep walking, you know, and it's just like verbal. It's like we're having a conversation. It's getting intense but we're not feeling threatened yet. So we keep going, we keep going. The sun's blazing. And this is a part of Kansas where we're getting blown and blown by, uh, um, by uh, cattle trucks all the time. So it's, re- it's stressful. Um, <laughs> and so it's, the stress is kind of weakening my capacity to be alpha in this conversation. <laughs> and so it's, at some point it gets stronger and now I'm like, it's, it's starting to pan- I'm starting to panic a little bit. Like, okay, now it's like pushing. You heard the term turtle head. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. Prairie <laughs> yeah. dog Prairie is dog. another. Prairie yeah. dog. <laughs> so I'm, I'm starting that journey a little bit. You know, you're starting to kind of grab your hands are now involved. So it's not just an inner conversation. Your hands are involved. Like you're trying to do something with your body. Like that's going to help just shift things. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you like, you know, just put the backpack on, it'll resort itself. Because in eyesight, I just kept seeing, I, I, would, I would have to, I would be seen. So I'm just gonna hold it out, hold it out, hold it out. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was just like it, I, like when I think of people getting struck by lightning, <laughs> this is where it was just like, you reach that point, you're having, the, you're having the conversation and the dialogue, you're trying to talk it down. Then you're moving the body and it's getting uncomfortable and you're starting to sweat more because it's like poking out. And then uh, God and the sun and the sky just opened up and it literally felt like I was being um, struck by lightning. It was like, (coughs) now. And so I literally, it was starting to come out um, and I literally, I ran, there were, you know, there's ditches down the side of the highway. I'm running down the ditches. I literally put Kanoa, I try to tie him to the tree. He's yelping and screaming. Like he's just a husky. So if you know huskies, they're loud. Mm-hmm. So he's making it. Re- he's the siren. I'm running through. A <laughs> hey, my dad's shitting everyone. <laughs> oh my god! I literally was running through, and it was so annoying because it was a short little cornfield. <laughs> it was not a tall, gracious cornfield. This was for whatever reason wasn't growing the way it should be, or it was a different strand. And so the squatting, well. Because I was so frantic, I didn't have anything with me because Kanoa's tied to my backpack for weight because I don't want him to. So I'm tying the backpack. I don't have anything with me. So now it's coming. I mean, it's actively coming out. So I'm running my ass in like I'm running through the cornfield. I see like taller, taller cornfield pieces further in the distance. I'm running towards those. But my ass is already out because it's because co- I don't <laughs> want it in my pants. So I'm. Ass is out, Kanoa's barking and screaming, cattle trucks are going by, I see farmers in the distance. I'm like, this is it, it's coming <laughs> out. If someone zeroed in, they'd see it coming out. And then I just, I'm, I'm literally like spread out, finally get to the taller grasses. And then it just continues because I don't have anything to wipe. And I'm like, and it was one of those kind of like, it started off, you know when you, this is getting real, I don't know if y'all want all You can't details. go too graphic yeah, okay. on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of one of the ones where it had a mixed relationship. Like the beginning, you felt like it was all gonna be solid. But then at the end, it has like air bubbles and it has another story. <laughs> so now it's starting to splat. And you know, it just kind of spurts and opens and bubbles out and <laughs> God. So I was super annoyed that it was, it was making itself more complicated. And so now it's really messy and I'm just, 
and Kanoa is so loud. And, <laughs> I, and I'm worried because if Kanoa, like, like he's, I felt like he was secured tightly, but I felt rushed for a lot of reasons. So I'm kind of panicking. And I'm like, so then I just think, well, maybe it's dirt. I'm not, I don't know what to do. I'm going to grab dirt. I'm going to grab soil and try and wrap it with that. And then I'm smelling my hand and then I'm touching my pants and then I'm <laughs> grabbing. And then the leaves like were painful and then they started itching. I'm like, God, the leaves are probably poisonous. They probably have all the, all the different sprays. And so, um, it was a mess. <laughs> and so I basically slowly started walking. I was like kind of waddling back because I had mostly just dirt and dust covering <laughs> what needed to be wiped at the next stop. That's funny. They have That's gross. they have that amazing. poop scale that shows like the, the range poop of poops. Like it's really? like so like nine is like a very firm poop and like yes. one is diarrhea. Right. And I think we've all experienced it where you're like, you've touched most of the spectrum in a single shit. It sounds like that's what you That is what it was. <laughs> I also think of, there's a George Carlin joke where he talks about you've never seen, things you've never seen, a grown man running while taking his shit. <laughs> sounds like yes. you're pretty close to that one as that's well. That's what it was. Yeah. Oh, anybody who saw it got a show. <laughs> wow. Because it was literally, there was just no, it was so clear to me. And this is connected, a lot of my work right now um, is focused on pedestrian safety and mobility justice and helping to, I take a lot of elected leaders and city council and engineers and planners out on, on everyday roads. And one of the themes, and there's a, there's a practice in the book in chapter three, it's called walking as a human right. But a lot of like that experience and others like it are, are signals of like, when we think about public restrooms in everyday places and towns, people that don't and can't drive a car. And it, I mean, when you gotta go, when, all, when that shifts from like, oh, it's hard and I'm just gonna reorient, or like, no, don't come out now, to when it's just, the earth has decided. Yeah, <laughs> I think we've all been there before. The earth has decided, <laughs> yeah. it's no longer your decision. Yeah. One thing I think that's been interesting for me about this is your inspiration to get into this was all about nature, but yeah. at least the early part of the stories thus far is you've been so moved by your interactions with people. Right. And not that it needs to be either or, but it sounds yeah. like you went out looking for one thing and then you're finding joy in this whole other aspect of the journey. Yeah. Did you stick with keeping it a more personal experience or how did you find the mix between trying to be in nature versus trying to interact with your fellow man? Yeah, it was, de it was definitely, it was always, uh, a, uh, East coast because it's the towns are, are much closer together. Excuse me. It felt, I think just by the way of, I think I didn't realize that how much I was, um, enjoying, uh, the, the people moments I kept seeking that it almost felt like building trust with people in a really cool way and I had gl I had small I mean I had all day to walk and move so I did have moments every day like my my the moments I had on on the Potomac River on the CNO canal path were incredible and wonderful and intense with flooding waters and the things that I experienced with Kanoa my dog out there and so there were good glimpses of nature in between the more maybe social people thing and I knew that it was coming for me. I think in some way, I, it, I was potentially, um, what's the word? Uh, I was, I, I, the people, even though it was really good, it could have been a crutch. Like, can I be with myself? Mm. Like, can I be with myself alone in the woods for days at a time? Am I there yet? Am I ready for it? Do I, do I trust myself to survive it? So in some ways I was, I was, I was carrying fear when I, when I was coming into Colorado and Utah and Nevada, cause I knew that would be a whole different, that would, I knew it was coming for me in a way. Um, and so I felt like I was training myself in smaller doses on the East coast, um, where people would kind of help hold spaces between. And then, you know, I just knew I had to go to the desert. I had to get lost in the desert. And anytime anybody asks me, um, you know, and definitely later in the book, it's a lot more, you know, it's a, it, it talks a lot more about the natural nature connection. Um, but anytime anybody asks me, what was your favorite part of that walk? And I'm like, the middle of the high desert hmm. of Nevada, uh, every day walking and waking up to blue sage, nobody, wild horses, um, that big sky lost and found everything and nothing for days and days and days. So that, that is by far the most 
powerful experience. For and that me. must have been especially reaffirming since you were fearing it going into right. it and you weren't sure which direction it's going to go. And for you to cite that now as your favorite yeah. stretch of the trail, that's got to feel really good. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and I was scared, right? Like I was just, I had just, I had no idea. But it was interesting, like being from Colorado, I had a little more support once I got into Colorado. So I had people helping. I had people even join me for periods of time. Um, so I just felt like it, there was so much preparation leading up to the desert, but I still had to walk across the desert. Mm -hmm. And that was cool. Yeah. So part of your mantra, you had mentioned previously that nature is healing. Yeah. When you're having these interactions with people, the story of the woman running out in her work shoes in the rain, mm -hmm. um, like that's a really enjoyable experience. Did you feel like you were getting healing from these experiences or did you need to be more isolated in order to achieve that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say both for sure. I, I'm a relation, I, I, I mean, I am a relational person. I like to relate to people. Um, I think what I was, I was so, the tension that I was teasing out on the walk um, was like, was constant, like being authentic and being honest. Like when someone says, oh, do you have a wife back home? Or, oh, do you have, like, what do you say, Jonathan? Like, what do you really say? Like, you know, do you, um, like, just be you? And what does that mean? And that was so hard for me to figure out. And so it was literally unfolding over time. And so to have day three with that story of um, my, my friend Haley, just be, she was such an open person. And I'm like, oh my God, we're sitting on this couch and I feel, and I'm talk, we're talking about everything and it's okay. I'm still here. She's still here. You know, like she hasn't left. She hasn't said it was wrong, wrong or bad or whatever. Like, you know, things like that, that you just internalize. Um, and so it was, it was cool to have that, that experience right at the beginning and opened up some stuff. I mean, there were, there were, it wasn't always like that. Um, but I would say the combination, both for sure, has defi was definitely, and this is, I understand it a little bit more now, I feel like too, understanding more of kind of the, the neuroscience of walking and moving, like what happens when we're near trees and what happens when we're near water in terms of the chemicals that trees and water emit and what happens to the brain when we're breathing in these chemicals, like what happens in our, why, like, so the movement, like opening, opening me up in between meeting with people in between, you know, long periods in nature, like, so both of them very much felt healing. Hmm. Yeah. And you've got a chapter in the book, I forget the, the title of the chapter, but um, it's very spiritual and very natural. You talk about breathing with the trees yes. and just following waterways for as yeah. long as you can. Um, plant relating is another yeah. term in there. Yes. <laughs> Are these things that you were, engaging in yourself during this hike. And I guess if somebody's listening to this and they want to experience this kinship with nature, like, is there one practice that you've found to be the most beneficial? Uh, that's a great question. So I was doing it very, in, you know, very informally just because I think I was so desperate for, um, just, uh, you know, I, I, wanting new teachers and, and it was very clear, like, you know, non-human teachers as well, maybe even more so. And so I was like, I would just stand there and kind of look at a tree for a while. I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I, I might pee on you. <laughs> Is that cool? <laughs> like, it was really like, I'm not trying to be, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but I want, I want to be available to it. So it really started from that place of just whatever. And that sometimes it still is that like, I'm just, I'm here and I trust you. I think sometimes more than I trust people. And so there was a lot of that. There still is a lot of that. Um, but over the years, being somebody who like literally this has become my work and my life and my art, I've hosted so many walking, like hiking events with different groups under different themes with different people. And I've learned a lot from other people who are like really into tree meditation or tree, like just tree whisperer people. I just love it. Um, and so I... The, the one thing to your question that feels so practical or, or maybe simple is, um, you know, I, I really like the invitation of like protecting time to, so that term plant, plant relating, like even if it's just a tree in your front yard or a tree in a park or a tree along the trail, um, you know, I, I'm always drawn to the mud, what they call the mother trees, 
the, the mature ones, the ones that have been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, all trees for real, but like the mother trees who are, you know, if you've read any of the books or done any learning around how the mother trees send, chem, you know, nutrients and fungi to all the trees in the village and how they support hundreds of trees around them, um, what they provide in terms of, you know, just resources and oxygen for us and shade and all the gifts of what trees create for our ecosystems. Um, I seek the mother ones, so if you have a large one, maybe seek that one to start. Um, but like, I just, I start sometimes just kind of going up to it and then maybe slowly walking around it and just getting, just seeing the tree from different vantage points. So feeling the texture of the bark, noticing the shapes and the patterns of the veins and the leaves, um, honoring the roots, sometimes even in humility, kneeling to the roots, like doesn't need to be like religious or you don't need to be chanting <laughs> it doesn't need you don't need bells like just like relating to the fact that this this is actual that this thing is breathing and is providing life for so many things and kind of there's a humility in that that I really um that I really trust and um and so then cr creating a connection to a tree from different vantage points from a felt sense from um, a visual sense from a breathing sense and so and just as a slow walking practice so I, I host a lot of these like very simple um, movement meditations and so it doesn't need to be you know for people who have different abilities and paces different ages like to slowly move around a tree as a practice just to calm the mind to de-stress to make a connection um, it, it's it's powerful and I, I try and take that with me um, personally, I need it. Like I need that medicine mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. On the AT, I remember two particular trees. There's a very cool tree between the Georgia and North Carolina border. And then there's another, I think it's a really old oak mm -hmm. along a dirt road. Um, and those two, I just thought were super cool. Yeah. Do you have an all time favorite tree? Oh. Triple crown of trees. Yeah, Triple <laughs> crown of like your top three trees, <laughs> like, like specific trees. So many. Y'all hear me moaning. <laughs> 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 I love trees. I tell people when I, like, I just host these walks. And I'm like, pre-warning, this could be like a group of, like, civil engineers who are talking about traffic studies. And I'm like, y'all, first of all, just so you know, like, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about the intersections. We'll talk about sidewalks. But this tree. <laughs> Look at this fucking tree right <laughs> here. I am beyond a tree hugger, just so we put it out there. I lick them. I smell them. So don't be weird by it. I invite you to do it. Um, anyway, it's... It, it's a big thing for me. I'm obsessed. But I would say um, there are some mature juniper trees, juniper cedars that are in. So I have a small little tiny home that I actually built on Teresa's property, mm -hmm. uh, Martinez with CDTC, um, that's now in Salida. And I uh, spend, that's where I do a lot of my art making and my drawing. Um, it's off grid, It's but it backs up right near not it's maybe a mile away from the Arkansas River and there's watersheds there with these old junipers and the junipers are just there's two in particular um, that are easily 200 years old they're, they're they're you know they're huge and the way the juniper um, the medicinal properties of juniper which are just vast uh, but you have you have these trees that are slow growers the color of juniper cedar, as we know, with that sharp red, the smell of fresh cedar juniper, which is just, w is so rich. The color of cedar juniper on the inside, but the way a cedar juniper is always, um, is always shedding. It's a relationship, like we can always shed, let go of shit. Just uh, like the way they're constantly, no matter the season, you just see them constantly shedding. And that's the story for all trees, but it's extremely noticeable on a juniper, the way the little, You've seen junipers where the bark is spiraling out. Um, I think also as a as a you know just somebody that doesn't necessarily trust binaries. I'm like anybody. Like we are just these juniper trees just give a lot of permission with the branches. They're twisting and bending in all these different ways. They don't look like a traditional straight and narrow tree. And I just think they give a lot of permission for us to like twist and bend and break and be different. Be okay. Be you. And I I love that so. Um, there's one right outside of the tiny house that I just, I spend a lot of time with and that's, it inspires a lot of the drawings that I draw. Yeah. So you're probably not surprised by this, but on this podcast, we talk a lot about like the traditional through hikes, right? Like yeah, the, the yeah. Pro popular U S trails. And I think one of the things <clears throat> that is very inviting to people about that 
is the ability to reinvent themselves with a trail name. They don't even have to go by the same name. Yeah. Was there any part of you that considered doing one of these hikes for that element of it, just to be able to go in and reinvent yourself with a, a whole new identity? Yeah, I love that question. Um, not, you know, I, I would say I've been so curious about going just, just, just to do it, just to be on, on one of the traditional trails for a while. I mean, I definitely got a couple days on them as I was going. Um, I think I, I think that cross country walk was so redefining. I mean, it transformed everything for me that I, I don't feel like I, um, not yet. I'll just say like, not yet. I think it's, I think it could be there. Um, and I so understand it and I'm curious about it. Um, but I crave even just the walk that we did just this la these last seven weeks. I mean, the mixing of, um, of the OCT, which we walked the Oregon coast trail, which was awesome and then uh off of that into roads and there's something and i write about this in the book i do a lot of work in in justice and organizing around systems and um you know thinking about because i just after after my cross-country walk i was like Oof, i'm feeling really good i ain't never going into a box <laughs> ever so i'm like I, and i don't i want to be a part of how do we make how do we how do we break up these systems that made it so almost so easy for me to just step in front of that traffic i don't ever want to i want to be a part of repairing healing opening and so part of the tension that i trust at least for my work i, I there's something devastating about what we've done to our built environments um related to cars and this is not an anti-car pitch y'all i drive and i don't have a car but i ride in car so don't take this as car shaming that's what i'm saying <laughs> disclaimer this isn't car shaming this but i don't have one <laughs> this isn't car shaming but it really isn't I, I love everybody so it's like but there's something very real for me as someone who knows now intimately the medicine of moving in an unhurried way and what happens there with people with nature with self but then also like the devastation of what where so many people live and how uh, and how we conduct daily life that the tension of that um, being a teacher for me as an artist like to inform my art and my poetry and my activism um, is is so is so uh, it's not a, it draws me to routes that will tell a story of nature connection but also how is Olympia Washington taking care of people who live in public housing related to the millions of people that can't drive a car so that they can experience the benefits of moving the way we're made to so that older adults can move more freely where they live so that kids can play so that people who use wheelchairs and mobility devices can experience unhurried movement where they live and see the trees and do the things if they can't get on the trail like what what are the different things in our systems that um, are, are blocking or inviting maybe good examples uh, that, like the medicine of movement hmm. um, and so that compels me more now, at least, when I create routes. Like, what's going to tell an interesting story of... But then, just, like, I need to just be in nature on a peaceful trail for a while, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't want to be surrounded by that all the time. Mm -hmm. And that was why we, my partner and I started with the OCT. We were like, oh, we're going to start with this and just get three and a half weeks walking the Oregon coast and just be in it to kind of re... Like, to your question in a smaller way... Uh, just to re recalibrate everything, mm -hmm. so it's not the noise of traffic and job and life and Walmart and Walgreens and whatever it is. Like you're just recalibrating. So I really honor that. Yeah. Do you find it frustrating with the direction that we're moving at in society at large? Because I feel like people are more nestled in their boxes and it's just trending in that direction more and more every day. With work from home, it just becomes so easy yeah. to never leave your house and engage with your community. Um, you're obviously fighting the good fight, trying to get people on the other side of that, but is it frustrating for you to see that the way that society is moving more at large? It, uh, endlessly, yeah. It's, it, yeah, there's frustration, there's exhaustion, there's anger. You know, it's interesting as, <laughs> as someone who suppressed so much as a kid, you know, like I'm a, I, anger's complicated for me because I'm, I'm still an angry kid, <laughs> but I'm a loving kid, but I'm angry. And so my frustrations, like it's like, this is kind of back to the walking as medicine thing. Like I need to be moving this way as an artist and as a writer. And if I'm going to, if I'm going to stay, uh, or at least lean in to the, 
I don't want to call it just a fight, but like if I'm going to lean into that work of trying to like unpack and train people that are working on these things around mobility and, and access and health and all these things, um, if I'm going to continue showing up there and not get burned out, not be so frustrated that I just, I can't even, I can't even do it anymore. I can't play. Um, then I need to protect time to do these, like these long ass walks. Like I, I came back from that so energized for just another season. I still fantasize about going into the tiny house and drawing for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that may happen. It may happen next year. <laughs> I don't know. But like, for right now, um, because it is, it is, it is frustrating. It is exhausting, and I'm still seeing like it's cool because I'm, I you know I try to do a lot of work with younger audiences, uh, just to connect with you know college age, just up and come like just Trent. What are what are young people feeling? What are they sensing? Um, and so that there has been a lot of encouragement in that space, seeing how creative young people are getting in civic work um around you know breaking this stuff up too and um trying to create more you know places where people can just kind of stumble into each other not centering the car and all of our urban planning and um, making it so we can just more easily like stumble upon neighbors and community and not have it be so programmed and scheduled and kind of intense but just kind of stumble upon it more Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do we do that with the built environment and with place and how to, so there's a lot of young people doing some cool stuff. So I do have hope to kind of combating some of the frustration, which is nice. What are some examples of like some wins you've seen in this work? Cause I feel like on one hand, it's like, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> That'd be really great. And then on the other hand, it also feels like with how dependent we are on cars, resistance is futile. Right. Yeah. So what are some wins that you've seen that make it hopeful to you? Mm. <laughs> uh, there, so I would say th there are several and I would just say at this stage, they're definitely smaller scale, you know, but there are some cool things happening when you have the combination of elected leaders, a mayor, city council, you have urban planning professionals and you have really like op just more open minded engineers and you have advocates and community involved in all these different. So if you've got that whole cocktail of things, you know, I've seen some really cool stuff. An example, there's a great, um, there's another podcast. I think it's the, on the Freakonomics podcast. A friend of mine just sent it to me. But there's a great story about a mayor who really trained and worked and pushed his engineers with a lot of community support to center uh, getting rid of all, like most, your most of your common stop and go intersections and center like r center like the smaller but still like you can still have traffic flow roundabouts mm -hmm. where you've got shorter crossings you've got public space because you're kind of moving a little bit more into the into the maybe the private or the public space so you've got trees you've got places for people to sit you've got maybe places where vendors can kind of set up stuff and you can do some events next like you're creating place you're still allowing the cars to go through and you're, pr you're making it safer for people to walk and roll. And this little town in Carmel, Indiana, where this mayor and this council and these engineers have all kind of been on the same page, have been doing some really cool stuff. Like, all, I mean, I don't know how many, it's like 68 now roundabouts. They've taken out most of their intersections mm -hmm. and they're like, that's a cool example. Mm -hmm. um, Denver has some good examples just with some of the, some of the sidewalk policy around moving some money they're hiring, you know, there's more bike lanes going in. Um, things like that are happening. Uh, Washington State, it was great to just move with some folks who work at the Department of Transportation and learn that they have just continued hiring more people who are primarily and only focused on active transportation to inform state dollars and to shift resources, not take, take all the resources from cars, but like to shift and distribute and break it up and hire more people focused on that so to, to hear things like that feel like good wins um but we still have you know in the u.s we have a long way to go we gotta we got a lot of work to do to to, to shift it from a policy side from an education side and one of the um but it's it, but it's happening you're just getting and you're getting a lot more young people who are now um becoming the professors becoming the trainers becoming the pe who've grown up with just a different way of wanting to um you gotta of wanting to be in their community i don't want a car mm -hmm. i don't want to drive my car 
I want to ride my bike. I, I'm like, I'm done. And and they're and they're a public health professional and they're an engineer. And so they go in and they're starting to make these changes. So it's going to be a little while, but we st- we have got some good young professionals that are um, that are really showing up, which I which which encourages me. Yeah. So speaking of urban hiking. Yeah. And you live in Denver. Yeah. Are there any good routes or sections of the city that strike you as your favorite, most walkable sections? Or if you're trying to get from one part of the city to the other part, you're happy because you can take Route Z, like whatever that might be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, it's tricky in Denver. Um, I would say there's definitely, I mean, Denver has some great like kind of micro trips, you know, especially if you're connecting it to, you know, the Cherry Creek and the Platte. Um, the Clear Creek path. If you're building in some recreation, if you're not on a powered scooter or wheelchair, if you're able-bodied, right? I mean, because so many of our sidewalks are cracked, out of date. The tricky part about Denver in most cities, and I, there's not great examples for the longer thing from a, from a like a big mobility space because we privatize pedestrian mobility. So it's up to the landowner. It's up to the business or the homeowner or whatever that block or half block of property is, it's up to them whether or not there's going to be a sidewalk or if the sidewalk is 50 years old or if it's just going to be dirt for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, you get states and cities that come in and they'll, 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 they'll finish the network with permission from all the different players and people. But it's, so we don't have, we don't like, there's parts in some of the newer developed areas like, I think about, um, you know, there's areas in Central Park, which is previous Stapleton, where you can get a nice flat sidewalk for a while and connect to some of the parks, but it's still kind of spread out and you don't got a lot of destinations that are within kind of a walking distance for a lot of different ages and paces. Um, So I I feel like from a mobility access place, we're not in a great spot, but from like an urban hiking through hiking, if you're gonna do a long route um, and you're able-bodied and you can do that, I I think, you know, once or twice a year, I'm always taking groups um, from Golden. To, I do a Golden to Denver walk. So we start in downtown, and then we go, we go up to South Table, and we walk all the way to downtown and take the train back. Hmm. And it's awesome. Hmm. I mean, it's 18 miles. People are like, oh, my God. Like, we're on top of South Table. We see little Denver. And then by the end, we, like, see little Golden. And it's just a cool – for people that have never even – but are at least able to do some of that, it tells a really cool story. I've got a great route um, hmm. for that. And I try and host that once or twice a year. I love that. I do love um, some of the stuff around Littleton, um, just connecting to the Mary Carter Greenway. I love some of the connections um, that are starting to pop up along the Clear Creek. I think, so I'm hopeful for maybe like five, 10 years from now, um, where we're seeing connections from like the Clear Creek Trail, the Dry Creek, you know, and connecting that to transit lines. So that's pretty cool. And And that's where I think Denver's ahead of other places where we've got a little more transit connecting to greenway paths. But what's hard is like Federal and Alameda and Pecos and Wadsworth and Sheridan, these are all what are called arterial corridors that are state managed. And we don't have a line item in our state budgets for sidewalks and that's a problem and we see it and we feel it. And so that's a lot of my work with pedestrian dignity is just trying to educate and highlight and bring people into it. for the purposes of a lot of the benefits that, you know, that we experience on trails that I experience just getting out for hours at a time to move. Yeah. So uh, Colfax is the, what is it? The longest commercial yeah. street in the U S yeah. have you done that? Yes. Hike. I don't know what you describe it. Oh, walk. Yeah. The marathon, the Colfax marathon in that, like that 26 mile walk. Yes. Yeah. We used to, so with walk to connect, this was, Walk to Connect was an organization that um, I was I started and experimented with a lot of good people after the cross country walk because I was obsessed. I was like, oh my god, I'm changed, walking forever, and <laughs> and I just wanted I wanted to take people out just to get out and move. So Walk to Connect formed in 2020, 2012, and similar to the Golden to Denver, we did a Colfax um, all the way in East Aurora, all the way to oh my gosh, yeah, and that that is an experience. Hmm. That's an amazing experience. It's a story. It is a story of a city. Oh, yeah. have you done it? Have you all done that? Uh, we've no. talked jokingly about <clears throat> yes, doing it. You should. Yeah, with my limited 
time something yeah. <laughs> like that makes much more sense than the things yes. i used to be in my bucket list at least for right now yeah uh, yeah it's something i would like to do eventually for sure um and so you mentioned walk to connect one of the things that you did with that was you noted walking leaders yeah what is that yeah so we pretty quickly on like we i so when i came back from my cross country walk i was like oh my god more people need to do things like this like blah, and i was just so obsessed and so then i just started a meetup because i didn't know what else to do and i just called it walk to connect because i was like oh, i like it was all about connection and and i just put a couple events out there and i was like um 26 mile loop around the city because you know i just got done walking the desert and i'm like 26 miles there'll be people nobody signed up <laughs> Nobody signed up. Next week, I'm like, that's got to be the mileage. 24. 24. <laughs> 26 is in today and 24. I'm like, nobody signed up. So then by week three, I'm like, okay, 18 is a better number. And I got three people. And we did this badass walk 18 miles around the city. And I was like, that's it. So then I just started hosting walks. I was experimenting. I was holding and juggling different jobs to make it work. Um, and then within a year or two, like, I'm like, people want this. They want to move with their neighbors. They want to move. And not everybody's down for 18 miles <laughs> in a day. And so I was like, I really wanted to continue leading longer distance walks. But then I was starting to lead small. And then as I started to diversify it, more people then were like, well, I want to do this. Well, this is where I can you do it at my park? Can you come to my neighborhood? I'm like, no, can't. One person <laughs> just can't. So then we started training. I don't have a car. Yeah, I don't have a car. <laughs> like, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. So then I just, we started like, we started with this kind of, you know, mock experimentive training that was very grassroots and off the cuff at the beginning. But then we then they we had a community of people that started leading their own events. And then fast forward to several years later, we were hosting what we called walking uh, leader trainings uh, once a month out of green spaces, which was a co-working space in Denver for it, still there, I think. And we were hosting trainings and we had several and still have several. Um, hundred leaders that are hosting walks and we started doing partnerships across the country and we're working with different groups to just because nobody was really out there doing a, a focus training on um, on on kind of walking urban hiking especially with some of the longer distance stuff we were doing and some of the creativity of connecting neighborhoods and different towns and cities um, did this really cool segment walk from uh, Fort Collins to Trinidad which is awesome. I have the route Trinidad? on my um, Trinidad's just south of Pueblo, just before you get okay. to New Mexico. That's a long walk, <laughs> y'all. It is in terms of an urban hike. I have the Intrinsic Paths is the website, but I have the route on there. And if you just, you can just take the route and go. And it's a cool story of nature and city and suburban, stressful at times, but really, really inspirational. For a lot of it anyway so things like that were just in the mix of this experiment for many years yeah i feel like that could be a good like map for people who are on the cdt and get hit with that heavy snow because i know that point. oftentimes people road walk when that happens and they're being hashtag true to the through right yes um yes so that could be a good resource for them because a, a lot yes. of the times people say the road walks are boring right but if there's the way you're painting it some type of excitement to it yeah oh to i intentionally build it so that you're doing the you know there's still road walking but it's m intentional roads that get you to little towns and villages or parks or open spaces connecting the trails yeah it's mixing it up so it might add a little bit of time but it's going to be way more interesting hmm. yeah so <clears throat> in a previous interview we interviewed brianna de sanctus who did the american discovery trail and okay. both routes of it and she actually came here straight from the trail. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah. And uh, she was a ball of energy, a very funny conversation. <laughs> but a lot of what she had to say about the American Discovery Trail were negative things. Sure. Like she just thought, you know, she's going through a lot of small towns and like a lot of it wasn't interesting. Yeah. Is there one stretch or section of the trail that stands out to you as being maybe not the most enjoyable? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, well, I, I think... Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, there there are, I would say Kansas is complicated. You know, there's, well, I'm trying to think of ADT. Does it go through Kansas? Is it south? I it doesn't even have to be the ADT, maybe just, just specifically. On, just on my route. Yeah. yeah, 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 I got it. Okay, so I would say um, the most, the, the hardest part, the most stressful part was Missouri. 
I was sharing a little bit about the bag of ticks. <laughs> <laughs> bag of ticks. If you're going to walk across Missouri, I, you know, if you get more than 65 in a day, let me know. <laughs> um, but it, it was a breaking point. Like it, you're talking 18 to 22 mile days, road walking, mostly all of it. Um, there just wasn't a lot of options to reroute unless you're adding days to the trip and then you're further away from just water and fill up and, and, and little towns. Um, I love the people. I had amazing moments. The Katy trail was awesome, but there were stretches in Missouri as I was getting closer to, um, to Kansas city where I, it, it was just unbearable. And Kanoa was just like, I ain't I, I'm done with mm. this walk. <laughs> and so he was just stopping. His body was done. We would just, so we were in tension, the weather, the ticks, and so I almost, I actually almost hung it up in Kansas City because of how hard that was. It was so hot and it was so hard with the roads. Um, but, you know, just had a good, I, you know, I was able to recalibrate. I had some hard, complicated days in the desert, um, but it wasn't like for long stretches. But I really, you know, you, you, you meet some of your, you meet yourself out there and it, and you meet other, you know, I kind of lost my, in a beautiful way and in a chaotic way, lost my, I mean, I, lost my mind right like for days and days and days and days in the desert with no people nobody i mean i had some good naked days just walking on the highway <laughs> just on the highway yeah on highway 50 let it swing letting <laughs> it swing <laughs> freely happily openly and um I are, had, are the cars honking well so this is highway 50 they call it the loneliest highway in america so there were stretches where i would be out there for three four hours and not one car hmm. nothing so I'm just like, well, this is the time to just be you, all of you, get some sun. And I did. And I, um, I had some alter ego stuff. Like I have, an, I have a great story. I don't know if y'all like go into that. What, oh, yeah. What, no, um, this sounds like a good direction. Yeah, Take sure. us there. So my alter ego in the deserts where it really came out was, and I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but it was Kate Blanchett. <laughs> standing on a stage wearing overalls without like just with a light white tank top barefoot <laughs> addressing global leaders <laughs> it was that specific and it was constant it was like why kate blanchett why barefoot why addressing <laughs> global leaders but it was on point and she showed up all over the place can she make an appearance right now <laughs> <laughs> like just a recount oh god i don't know you know, I just would get out there and I mean, it would be, I just would, something would rise up around, you know, just something that I, maybe I suppressed and just never was able to fully like just talk out whether it's related to how we treat animals or food or the land or how we like, how we talk to or church stuff and religious stuff and political stuff and binaries and. So I don't know that I, I might, I don't know that I can fully go into it, but you can maybe hear it in my tone where it would just be like, she would be in Kate Blanchett with her, like the way she, y'all see that. What's the recent Kate Blanchett movie that's out right now when she's don't a, look up. Yes. So like that, she's just that, like she's not moving. She's staring at you. She's got that face. She's grounded. And she's just like looking through all the leaders who aren't like doing the work. Oh, she, I just get into it. <laughs> okay. Zach's a leader. That's not doing the work. <laughs> Sounds about right. You're Kate. <laughs> Oh gosh, we're playing this out. And this sounds go. About right. <laughs> He's not gonna let you go. There is no getting little. Oh my god! I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> I just would. I I think I just would. I'd let myself totally off the rails, and I'd be so open. But I just, um, just kind of the unapologetic, like how you know, just like how you know. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to get into it. You can put a, your sunglasses on if you need to. Oh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> let me just maybe, I mean, maybe let we, we can do it with what I do a lot with just even pedestrian dignity stuff, but just like, mm, I'm trying, I don't know if I can go there, y'all, because <laughs> I got to be out there to really do it. Do you need do, to, to take do, off all your to, clothes to first? Do yeah. what it, to, to honor it. We'll fill this like room with sand to embody the desert, yeah. get you back to that place. <laughs> but y'all, I'd be like, I'd be, you know, like I'd, I, I mean, this is maybe just an example, but I, like when I would really get in flow and I'd maybe be picturing a certain senator or something and I'd like, I'd hit, cause I had my, my custom baby, I had a baby stroller across the desert. So I'm like hitting the stroller <laughs> naked. It's Kate Blanchett. Like 
if if you actually cared like if you at you know and just just you would you would stop driving you'd replace your trips you think you're an engineer you think you're an engineer but you're gonna stay and in, stay inside and stay in the car I, we need you to we need you to plan for the safety of all people plan for this replace your trips you know so I just go I just that's not even that doesn't do it justice that doesn't sound anything like Kate Blanchett <laughs> but like it's the way she I think her face looks maybe when she's serious I just was you know kind of the way see your I'm, I'm I've got the side by side going <laughs> well, I don't know what it is I'm having the best time <laughs> I'm having the best time I just there's something about like when a certain face or someone who's so con so grounded in their convictions where it's like you're being invited in but you're going to hear the ground and I just think that that's where I was I was tapping into that and for whatever reason it was Kate Blanchett hmm. love that I wish I could do perform better no that, was that great. wasn't great no it was it wasn't great it was great for me <laughs> it was great for I you. had okay, a great good. time <laughs> so to come back to <laughs> so to come back <laughs> To come I back to it. this <laughs> hike, walk, what do, you, do you have a terminology for what this was? A hike, a walk, a, a pilgrimage? Yeah, um, definitely, all, yeah, all of it, yeah. just all of it. Was there, you mentioned this was healing and that uh, movement and nature's medicine. Was there one moment that stands out for you that was like the breakthrough moment, your turning point to feeling like you were on the right side of the road to healing? Yeah. Yeah. I, it was honestly, um, it's funny. Yeah. It's directly connected like that. Those times in the desert where I could just scream and wail and yell and sing and dance and just be thrown by the weather, those thunderstorms coming through <laughs> when you're just out there. I, no, no, there's no tree really to hide in. I taking naps in the culverts under the roads. Um, there was a, the freedom that I felt uh, to be so exposed, um, to be so alive, to be so naked, literally and metaphorically, <laughs> <laughs> to be, I, I just, uh, so connected to the grief that I've carried my whole life to be connected to the dream, like to be able to dream. So having walked, you know, across you know the first state and this is why it was so beautiful about just what unfolded like the first state delaware two and a half days to get to the state line you know the, the so the like just the way knowing that i had crossed these states as markers as benchmarkers of i talk about it a lot in the book like and i think i even title a section um you know i have what it takes whereas before everything inside of me and around me was telling me you don't have what it takes mm. You don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes to be strong. You don't have what it takes to be honest. You don't have what it takes to be this raw, funky, loud, achy, gay, queer, sensitive, kind of masculine, kind of not. Who are you? Funky. You don't have what it takes. Fit in. Be liked. Be what other people want you to be. You know, all the voices that say, like, that we're trying to tear me down. And to be in that desert and to be able to speak, like, I have what it takes. I'm strong. I'm alive. I'm 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 weird. I'm I, all these things. Um, I, and to do that for days and days and days with witnessing of wild horses, while staying with people who live on communes, while like I, surviving the desert was like was it was was a marker. Hmm. And I got to that beach in San Francisco, just like oh, this is this is there has been transformation. Yeah. Yeah, because you'd mentioned, you know, when you were a kid, you felt like you had to always wear a mask to always. be somebody that you weren't. Always. And then you're in this experience where you get to be so unfiltered oh. yourself. Ah. That's got to be very transformational. Uh, yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it changed everything. Is there anything else about the journey or the book that you want to relay to listeners? Mm. Yeah, I think just I the... Um, the medicine aspects of moving in an unhurried way, you know, and, you know, I just, I'm always trying to, with the book, I tried to make it, it's very honest, it's a creative nonfiction, it's a funky piece, it kind of, it, it jumps around in some ways, but the arc in the book is meant to be just a lot of invitations to make moving in an unhurried way uh, honest and accessible to a wide range of people, 
related to the medicine of just moving in a way where we're all like for, in a way of connecting to each other um, in a way of healing um, around the inside journey with just even if it's just around a tree in your neighborhood to the next town um, but then also pushing edges around movement as resistance so you can actually be with the things that are hard and difficult you know I I'm constantly doing that as a practice where if I'm stressed and I'm feeling frustrated or I'm feeling at my edges, like I literally will move like a practice and an intention to go on a 20, 30 minute walk, knowing all the benefits. Now it is actual medicine just to, just to get out for 30 minutes. Um, and then some of the right, right of passage stuff that I write about in there around these long journeys that, that you all in this podcast nurture so much around just the, the need for how are more of us, connecting to ourselves in the world in, in this unhurried way and um, it's medicine and so that's yeah just close with that <laughs> um, and before we wrap it because oh, yeah, you, you had mentioned this previously yeah. the term pedestrian dignity yes. I know this is tied very closely to your work nowadays yeah. define that yeah. what something that the listener can do to help with that cause mm -hmm. and yeah I guess what do we need to know yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so the Pedestrian Dignity Project is, it's primarily, um, it's it's a media project, so it's definitely, it, it's online on Instagram and TikTok primarily, also on, y'all, I'm 40 and I'm on TikTok, y'all hear me. I want to talk about that in a second. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Trying, but I'm loving it, but I'm <laughs> hating it. I'm hating it and I'm loving it. Um, so all y'all TikTok people, it's, it's, it's been pretty fun, check it out. So Pedestrian Dignity is a, an ex it's an experiment. I call myself a walking artist, so I'm, I use the term experiment intentionally. It's evolving. It's trying to just experiment around how to create media to center the lived experience of what people who walk or roll, if you're on a wheelchair or a mobility device, what people who move through this world, often without a choice, but even if you were to choose to do more of it, like what is that lived experience like from home to the bus stop, to the grocery store, uh, to the library? but definitely centering people that have no choice, that can't drive a car for medical, financial, legal, um, physical ability reasons, and how are we in our planning and engineering and in our neighborhoods and communities making it more accessible and, and how are we centering it based on the medicine? So a way to get involved would be to um, just start looking around your own community, replace car trips. If you're a driver, replace your car trips for a week. There's a campaign coming up um, called National Week Without Driving, October 2nd through the 8th. And so if you're a driver, just re just give yourself a little more time and learn about transit systems and have that filter of pedestrian dignity, the dignity of people moving in this way that don't have a choice. And as an advocate or someone who cares about neighborhoods and community issues like this, have that filter on and notice, like, is it safe? Do I feel safe in my body to cross here? who is out here and who's trying to navigate on a powered scooter and they're forced into the road. Um, and so engaging that in your own community. And then if you are engaged and you find things and you're curious, report those things. And if you want to go even further, take little videos, take some photos and submit them to the, to the project yeah. and we'll share them. And, um, and if you're in Denver and in the network here, we do have a local organized organizing community working on local projects. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever seen um, this guy, Zach Anner, on YouTube? He has cerebral palsy. No. Okay, I'm going to show you this video when we get off air. If you're listening yes. to this and this is piquing your interest, the video I'm referencing is Zach Anner and the quest for the rainbow bagel. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so he, he has cerebral palsy, and yep. he makes these videos that use comedy to highlight like accessibility issues yeah um and this video is hilarious he's oh on a gosh. quest to get this rainbow bagel in new york city and he's asking people for directions and like it's all methods that he cannot on his own huh. kind of get through because wow. of the lack of accessibility yep. but the way he kind of details it is it's good comedy I oh think. my gosh yeah. please send I'll it. Show yes. it to you I can't wait <laughs> It's, it, you know, you mentioned this, it's, I, I had an experience recently. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I live in Golden, which is, I think, a very yeah. pedestrian friendly place. Even I'm in North Golden and that's not nearly as pedestrian friendly as downtown. 
Um, but I had to take my vehicle into uh, to get some work done in Arvada recently off Wadsworth, mm -hmm. and they told me it was going to be a couple of hours. So I just you know Googled the closest Starbucks, and uh, there was one a quarter mile away. I thought it'd be very easy to get to, yeah. it, especially like, this is like a Arvada is a nice s suburban area, um, and. My walk there, there wasn't a single crosswalk. Yeah. I had to go across a four lane highway yes. with like a huge median. That's right. And like, it's just nerve wracking. Like that's not a good right. experience for anybody who has to get by on foot. So, yeah. and I'm sure that experience is multiplied by a thousand in cities, especially areas that aren't engineered to be pedestrian focused, even in the slightest. Yes, and it's such an, it's when you layer, like I always encourage people to layer, it's exactly what you're saying. Sometimes, you know, like the destinations where people get their car work done, you know, wherever you have maybe commerce, different commercial areas that are not maybe in the center of a town on a main street or in the core of downtown Denver, but you start getting out of the core of a town, like where a lot of the auto dealers are, the auto shop places or the grocery stores. But you also are layering some of that with, you think about, if you just research or if you maybe happen to live, then you know this experience, but researching and understanding where is public housing, where is lower mixed income housing, where are the most frequent bus routes in, in my community, and what are the roads like where those buses are going, and then you're layering it with some really complicated uh, class race. I mean, I think I'm always kind of bringing up redlining when we think about redlining in the cities or just in general in terms of where, where were black families like, you know, basically you can live here and go to school here and white families are here. And these lines are still real with where we where we when we look at these maps and how the roads are supporting public health and access. So just just from a from a research and curiosity standpoint, like a little bit of intention, the invitation is, you know, replace it, which is why I like the, I just as a seed, like just to replace a car trip or a couple car trips with that curiosity and that and that openness and just kind of thinking about how, what is it like for people that have to grind on these things every day. And especially I think for some of us, and this is where I try to tie it in in the book in a, in a creative and open way, but especially for people that really understand the benefits of walking and hiking, um, who can speak to the benefits and could be such great bridges to help inform a lot of the why around why we wanna make these places safer where people live, um, especially on those roads where those where you've got all these different destinations that a lot of people are trying to go, and it is literally you're you're darting for your life just to get to a grocery store, you know, and it's oh, it's everywhere. Yeah, <clears throat> I know you mentioned TikTok. <laughs> um, it sounds like you've gotten really good traction on TikTok. Like it's been a yeah. very effective oh. tool to get your message out. Yes. It has been, I mean, what has been so much fun, I mean, so I've been on this book tour now for about a year, and it, it finished up in Seattle just on this long walk on the Pacific Northwest, but it was so, I mean, I'm mostly in Colorado, it's my home, but it was so fun to have, I had a book event in Olympia and in Seattle, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of the people who showed up are younger Gen Z folks who have been following Pedestrian Dignity on TikTok. I'm like, y'all came out. <laughs> Here through, t and so it's just been the engagement, the community building, the education, the civic. I mean, the number of messages I get on TikTok now that are from um, early college, like that twenty-something age in college, or maybe, excuse me, just getting out of high school, discerning what their career moves are. The number of messages I get from people that saying, "I've, I'm, I'm studying urban planning because of this account," I've showed up at my first city council town hall meeting because of this account. I uh, started talking to my neighbor who, who stands out at a bus stop without a shelter holding six bags of groceries. And I've started to like, like support her and check in on her because she's there at the same time every day. And so I like these stories that I get from the, from young people who are, are, are creating uh, their own civic story through these 15 second, 20 second video clips on TikTok that talk about how shitty this intersection is and or how wonderful this sidewalk is or but it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's it's really been surprising and exciting and the connections have been incredible. It's still stressful <laughs> as someone who's 40 and who's trying to like s social media is just such a love hate. I love it and it's it and it's stressful. So it's both. 
Yeah, <laughs> I can definitely relate with that. Yeah. Well, the book is Walk, Slow Down, Wake Up, and Connect at One to Three Miles Per Hour. Jonathan, where should people go to keep up with you? You mentioned, obviously, the Instagram and TikTok. Give us all the avenues to keep up with you. Yeah, yeah. So um, all, all that on social media. Intrinsicpaths.com is kind of the home. You know, I, I call myself a multidimensional artist. And so a, a day in the life of a, of the, of a walking artist, is it, I can be, you know, we were talking about trees earlier. I can be hugging trees and taking a nap under a tree, doing a drawing. And then I'm writing poetry. And then I'm at an intersection cussing and on TikTok. <laughs> and then I'm, you know, hosting a training for um, people who want to be walk leaders or whatever. And so Intrinsic Paths is kind of the best home to maybe lean into some of those invitations. Um, but yes, Pedestrian Dignity on Instagram and on TikTok. Um, Jay Stalls on Instagram is my personal. There's a lot of photos from the uh, Oregon Coast, uh, the PNW Coastal Walk. I also have the route for the Coastal PNW Walk on the Intrinsic Paths website in case anyone's, anyone is interested. Also have the route from um, Fort Collins to Trinidad on there if you're curious and just reach out. I also have a Patreon. So to support and to be a walking artist, it takes unique income streams. And so Patreon is another way to support the work. Yeah. That's awesome. And before we go, I actually have to ask, how was the Washington leg of that hike? Because I've done the 100 northern miles of the Oregon Coast Trail, which oh, was fantastic. Yes. Uh, and I've been curious to explore the Washington coast, which I haven't done at all. So I'm curious to know what was your experience like? Yeah. So um, it was awesome. We, I mean, we, you know, because I do a lot of mixed road walking and I, we kind of had an understanding this. So my partner was with me. Um, and so that you know, some it invites needing more flexibility <laughs> um, in some ways. And so we just, we had an agreement that we would, we would check in as we go along the way. And it was a mix of roads and ferries sometimes to get to the islands. Um, sometimes we would take a bus south to then walk a different road to catch certain parks. So it was a mix of things, um, but it was, it was incredible. We ended up walking up to uh, Long Beach. We went from, um, Oh, what's the name of the town? I'm spacing it. Um, but anyway, I it the mix of walking on the coast, walking through different parks, through the cities in the urban, on the San Juan Islands, through Whidbey Island, and then all the way up to Cross Canada and to Vancouver. Um, it was awesome. So if you're curious about a mix of road walking and islands and ferries and beach time, um, definitely look at the route that we created because it it's pretty amazing if you want to stick to the trail olympic state park and some of these other areas have but it's different as you know then oregon coast is so organized around public beach access and it's just not the same in washington and you just have a lot more the higher tides have more of an impact on access in washington um, so we just couldn't get on as much beach mm. um yeah that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, this has been a very inspirational conversation. Thank you for making it to the studio and uh, sharing your journey with us on Backpacker Radio. Absolutely. Thank you both. Yes. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, this one, I love the feature because this is one of the rare Trek propagandas that comes courtesy of a Trek blogger. And this one's by Katie Jackson. She took the initiative to do a comparison of through hikes that she had done in back-to-back -back years, comparing the Colorado Trail and the John Muir Trail. And without any guidance from our ed editorial team, she absolutely murdered this one. Um, I wanna say this one's like 1600 words or longer. I, I forget, I didn't actually look at the word count right before this. It's a long one, beautiful photos from her hikes. Um, but she does a breakdown of the three trails comparing which one was harder, which one was prettier, and which one she just thought was overall better. I don't want to spoil any of the goodness, but mostly this is a shout out to Katie and a very well executed article that kind of came out of nowhere. Love that. Yeah, you've done both. I have. Which one gets your... Mm, I don't know. Okay, I don't know because the Colorado Trail I did in sections for the most part, which was, we've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, and then the John Muir Trail I did peak season when I was filling in the gaps for the PCT. So both were really good. I think if I was doing the PCT full through, I would pick the Colorado Trail, obviously. Um, but if I was doing it peak season, John Muir Trail was incredible. 
Uh, and because of the permit system there, I, I think I would carp that DM if made available just because it's more difficult to get permits than just bopping on the Colorado Trail. But the Colorado Trail is also insane. It's like a mini PCT. Yeah. Like you get all the cool stuff um, minus the Cochitope section. Yeah. That's a tough one because the, they're both amazing trails. The, the John Muir Trail, like throughout, you could close your eyes and take a picture anywhere and it's a postcard. Yeah, insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I would, if, if, if I had both presented to me and it was like, you can do either, there's no obstacles, I would do the JMT just because it's only going to get more and more popular yeah. as they do most things. Question of the day. This is a hybrid. This is uh, a f- segment we do on with great regularity. What's the stupidest thing you've done this week? Yeah. Um, mine is going to go to the $250 I gave to Harper's Vet this week. Um, <laughs> I've mentioned this to Zach, but we have recently had conversations in the house about keeping toilet seats down because um, – we have that like stuff you put in the back of your toilet that makes the water blue, but quote unquote cleans it. And I caught on to the fact that even though we have so many water bowls in every room of the house, every room of the house, literally the room next to this toilet room, some would call it a bathroom, <laughs> literally water bottle right, or water. And it's a self refilling water bowl. Like it's got a two gallon jug on it. Yeah. This isn't so something that could have been up. dry. Yeah. No, but Harper, I caught her drinking the blue water, and um, that explains the tremendous diarrhea she's been having at crazy hours in places that she usually wouldn't poop, um, and because they get such long butt skirts of hair. Oh, yeah, just sticks. Take him outside and take a scissor to it, so I cut off all her butt hair. Um, not, like, crazy, but... It, the, I just can't be pulling chunks of diarrhea out of it anymore. <laughs> so finally, after like a week of keeping toilets shut um, and being very assertive about it, finally took her to the vet and I was like, I, just, I need to make sure she's good. Um, and so they sent off her poo to get it tested. She's all good. Nothing's wrong. Ironically, as soon as we went to the vet, she stopped doing all of that. So I think she just wanted to have a laugh. She but just wanted to drain you of your bank account? Yeah. So that $250 I'll never see again. Yeah. And she just lays there while I work <clears throat> all day. So well, This one will make you feel a little bit better than that. Yeah. My stupidest thing of the week. Um, so the twins have reached an all-time bad with their sleeping. Like We're up every two hours and have been for the last two weeks, essentially. It's rough going at Casa Davis right now. Um, and the other day, every day just starts terribly because like you're not well rested, especially on the weekend because we're on full time parent duty and there's really no relief. Uh, I'm cleaning up the kitchen first thing in the morning and I step on one of Leo's toys and I don't have much of a wick on my temper candle right now. So that caused me to pick up the toy and just throw it to the uh, living room, which is down below. You walk down two steps to get down to the living room. And uh, it bounced off the table oh, no, and smacked directly into our very large, like 70 inch screen television. Oh, and I thought it was going to hit one of the dogs or no, the kids. No, that, that would have been worse, but uh, it broke the TV. Shut up. Yeah, it's not even that big or heavy of a toy. Just hit it perfectly, like at a 90 degree angle, caused a little bit of a crack, and the rest of the screen just went black immediately. <laughs> what happened to your temper at that point? Because I imagine you just. It just, it, it. it compounded. It's just, just <laughs> then like I turned it to like, I'm not the idiot asshole. It's the, everybody else's the fault world. that we have so many toys in this house. So I went on a spree where I got like a garbage bag and just started putting extra of Leo's toys into the garbage bag and threw a bunch of toys away. Um, so yeah, I just made it way worse. Wow. Yeah, I'm in a bad place. <laughs> it's a struggle right now. <laughs> I don't want to be in your yeah. house. No, actually today we are starting sleep training, um, which... If you're a parent, you're familiar with this, but uh, the sleep's about to get worse with the hope of it getting better. How is Jenna handling you like this? Because you kind of sound like a nightmare. Yeah, that was a fight. (laughs) 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 That was was a fight. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, things aren't awesome. (laughs) I don't have any silver lining right now. I'm laughing with you, not at you. Yeah, it's uh, it's not good. So, but uh, yeah, so we're down to TV. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, so you haven't been, you haven't had time to replace it yet? <clears throat> no, but I got the one picked out. The good news is, I mean, relatively speaking, it's still it'll still be more than your vet bill. But I remember when a TV that size was thousands of dollars. Yeah. We're not into the four figure range. It's still an expensive and terrible mistake. But uh, <laughs> I'm I'm happy that I broke this TV in 2023 and not like in 2015 because that would have been much worse. Jenna's got to get like a shadow box and frame this toy and just like put it on the wall and like make one of those little markers. That's Zach's temper. Yeah. September 2023. Yeah, like they do with like the fire danger thing. Like yeah. Zach's in the orange right now. Yeah, I'm between orange and red basically at all times. Uh, yeah, that Yeti danger high thing on yeah. the PCT. Yeah. Zach danger high. Yeah. Uh, fortunately on podcast days, Jenna takes more of the burden with the overnight stuff. So I'm actually pretty well rested right now. I'm, I don't feel like I'm going to toss those scissors at anyone, but yeah, I should keep, yeah, keep the sharp objects away from me. Yeah. We we should probably just put me in a bubble because you're going to have to wear (laughs) mittens when you come in this room. Exactly. It's, it's rough going, but yeah, that's my stupidest thing of the week. Okay. I also was punching my laptop (laughs) before you walked in. (laughs) (laughs) That wasn't an anger thing. Uh, just to feel alive. I, I was hearing like a little bit of a rattling and Leo has been playing with my laptop quite a bit of late. So I thought maybe he like spilt juice in it or something. Cause legitimately there was like popsicle drippings on the, at the other day. So I thought maybe like some of the hardware, the fan was malfunctioning or something like that. So you punched it. So I started like tapping it and I thought it was getting a little bit better. So I started to hit it a little <laughs> bit harder and then I moved it and I realized it was coming from this. Oh my God. <laughs> it the, was the place it's always coming from. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't even this unit it was something to do with the air vents and the fact that it's like it wasn't sitting flat on the table so i punched my laptop for no reason wow yeah you're thriving tough times i'm not yeah. this is not the highlight of my world right now this was another year of birth control for me right here yeah definitely um good okay uh let's go to today's triple crown this is a light one yeah. This is the triple crown of shows slash movies you've watched recently. Yeah, I'm so tempted to just be an asshole with this um, because I this week we've rewatched all three Lord of the Rings, <laughs> so that <laughs> could that easily be it. one, two, and three. Sure, go for I it. I don't know how you haven't watched these. Like these are so good. Yeah, <laughs> Lord of the Rings is so good. I I just I'll say it again. I don't do well with fantasy stuff. It's very tough for me to keep my attention. That being said. I can watch Avatar. I actually really like, like Avatar. Game of Thrones. Game right? of Thrones is another one. Helps when there's murder and tits. So okay, so what I'll say, and I was thinking this last night while I was watching the Two Towers, is the battle scenes in Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones are like the two best, just directed battle scene esque type things. Yeah. Um, I would. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. I would imagine Lord of the Rings isn't as gruesome. It's not gory, but just the way that they choreograph the different battles and the details they put into little things. Like, I I also forgot how long we're watching the uncut extended editions, and I, for, I forget the timelines because it's been a while, but Battle of Helm's Deep is crux of the second movie, and it's freaking fantastic. Like, Legolas is shooting arrows through two people at one time. He's riding a shield down staircase while shooting people him and Gimli are keeping track of their kill count like they're riding horses all over this bridge just knocking off orcs or Kai, excuse me um it's, and none of that is going to sell you as someone who doesn't like <laughs> fantasy but it's so good yeah i mean that's the best sell of the movie i think i've heard i just picture like trolls marching toward a volcano to get a ring no that would suck yeah that's what i think of lord of the rings without having seen it that's what's in my brain oh no battle helm steep is incredible um and i and i've noticed that i have aged since i've last seen it because when i first watched lord of the rings which wasn't the last time i've seen it but when i first watched it legolas was like it like mm. major Hot crush over orlando yeah. bloom I've never once looked at Aragorn any specific way. Aragorn, I can't remember if there's a second R. Him and Boromir were usually just like lighter and darker haired versions of each other. Again, this is going nowhere with you. But <laughs> like I was looking at him. He was looking good in that one. And yeah. he's older. Yeah. So he's technically so 87 your, in it. Your hot boy has shifted. Yeah, my hot boy. Well, because you never watch a movie when you're young. And yeah. you have like the crush on the 13-year-old totally. in the movie. Totally. And then you watch it when you're older. And you're like, I'm a pedophile if I still feel this way. My first movie crush was, I think it was A Land Before Time, was the cartoon character. was the uh, different. Yeah, no. But like, I remember, I don't know. Which dinosaur were you crushing on? It wasn't, I think she was a chipmunk. So I might even be thinking of the wrong movie. Jesus. Rescuers Down Under, maybe. Okay, yeah, that But one. like the female character in that one. Like, I think a lot of... 
guys that I knew had a crush on her. And it wasn't anything explicit about it. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but she was my first crush. Okay. Yeah. I was talking more about how, like, the, the yeah. character never ages, but you age. No, I'm sure I had the biggest crush of all time on uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. If I went back and watched that now, I'm guessing I'm not going to find, like, 16-year-old Jen- or Sarah Michelle Gellar that. Well, same thing with Gilmore Girls, because at first when you're watching it, you're like, Dean... Jess, those are the hotties, and then you go to rewatch it, and you're looking at Luke, the diner owner, yeah. um, who you usually never paid attention to. Mm. So yeah, I mean, even when we went to Wisconsin, it was striking to me how young college kids look. Like yeah, they keep getting younger. Yeah, uh, that the previous time I went to Madison, I didn't feel like there was as big of a gap. It felt to me like I was looking at high school kids. It was, it felt wrong. Yeah. Okay. So, Lord of the Rings. Okay. Um. All, all the trilogy, but mainly the second one. I would say the sec because the first one does a lot of story setting. Third one, I mean, it just continues the story as it should. But the second one, Battle of Helm's Deep. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'll give it a shot. Yeah. With my current state of affairs, I actually when the last of the kids goes down, I'm usually too tired to actually give focus to anything for an extended period of time. So there's been less shows and movies than I would have imagined otherwise. And on the weekends, if the TV's on, it's usually something kid-centric, Miss Rachel or Cars 2. I hope that's what your Triple Crown is composed of. <laughs> no, because I don't, there's, it's just background noise. I'm just scrolling Twitter the entire time. Mm. Um, but the few exceptions here, I do have them, is I am so into fall right now. And to me, fall is marked by the fact that it's football season. Mm-hmm. And the official start of football season, in my mind, is when Hard Knocks comes yeah, out. Yeah, we've been watching. Yeah. Um, uh, it's great. And the thing that's made me the most uncomfortable about this season is that I've fallen in love with Aaron Rodgers. Isn't it weird? He's so likable now. Well, I, I feel like he's playing a character to a certain extent, but growing up as a Bear, as a Bears fan, it feels wrong to like Aaron Rodgers, even if he's not on your rival team, but he's so likable. Yeah, and I I used to watch and like the movie Basketball, mm-hmm. and he references it in one of the episodes. Like oh, I he, they, that. they make this game where the game where he has to you have to yell something stupid at the guy when to try to distract them. Yeah, yeah. He told them it's from Basketball, and that's when he yelled that's right. that's that right. coach's name. Yeah. Um, as a joke. And so I got the I got Garrett and our friend um, to watch basketball after that because mm. Aaron Rodgers vouched for it. Yeah, I just remember the uh, scene where he walks up to his old coach. <laughs> he like sneaks up behind him and grabs his tit. He's like, "What's up, asshole? You fatty piece of shit." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's very funny. Um, number two on my list, I did this as potential uh, prep for an interview that is probably not going to happen because I think you're the one who flagged me on this was um, there's a popular AT, AT memoir that was recently turned into a movie on Netflix called Happiness for Beginners. Yeah. And I tuned into it because I like the two leads in it. It's um, what's your face from The Office, the one who took Pam's role at the desk. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah, but names don't work yeah. well with my brain. Hold on. I'll look it up is Ellie Kemper and the other lead is Luke Grimes who's one of the big characters in the show Yellowstone which I enjoy um and I didn't think very highly of the movie which is great that you were so quick at watching it because I hadn't started yet and I just never did it was the day that I so we were supposed to have a podcast that day it was the day I was getting the migraine so like legitimately I had to go lay down and that was the most productive thing I could do was just watch a movie on Netflix and it, I think it made my headache like, worse because it was so bad. <laughs> it's just very, it was, the writing wasn't good. It was corny. And I was waiting for it to have any semblance of AT-ness. And this was just like a general trail movie. Like there was no calls to the AT whatsoever. Huh. So I felt like I got two hours taken out of my life. Yeah. All right. Well. So that's not a that. ringing endorsement, but if you disagree with me, uh, podcast at the track.co. Yeah. No, I um. I interpreted Triple Crown as the best of, but that's a good one to add on there. Um, I'm going to do my second one. I have started recently a barter trade with my boyfriend where I will watch an episode. We decided this um, this past weekend, we were at a wedding and we were out one of the nights and everyone was like continuing to get excited to keep going out further in um, 
Burlington, I wanted to go lay down. And so he wanted to go watch his show. I wanted to go watch my show. And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, what if we do a swap see where it's episode for episode? Mm. Um, so he's now watching Gilmore Girls, okay. which is an essential fall rewatch. The new ones or the old ones? Old ones. Okay. Uh, and I am trading it for Modern Family, mm. which I've always seen bits of, like, on at some point Pete somewhere. Dunphy is one of the best characters of all time. I've never actually seen a full episode. Yeah. So I watched two full episodes. I fell asleep during the second one just because I was sleepy. Great show. Yeah. I will continue to have this trade yeah. happen. No. I feel like good sitcoms have the one character that will just carry the whole show. The whole show is good. I'm not saying that this is the only reason to watch it, but Pete Dunphy is fucking hilarious. Is yeah. that his name? It's been a minute since I've watched I don't, it. Again, names yeah. me. The dumb dad guy. That's the guy who yes. he makes the show. Um, so that's my second one. Third one, I wrote down, I've got more than three, which is the problem. Oh, oh, this is so hard. I'm going to have an honorable mention. Yeah. I should have done Modern Family as the honorable mention. That's okay. Recently watched the Blackberry movie. They made a movie oh. about like Blackberry. Yeah, like it's the phone. with, um, what's his face from It's Always Sunny? It's with uh, Dennis. Um, who's Dennis? You don't you don't watch It's Always Sunny. Which one? The first characters? one, Glenn Howardson. Glenn Howardson, yes. Um, it was incredible. Was it good? It was really good, and the way like the acting was amazing. The way they did the story was amazing. I was rooting for them. Like when I mean, everyone knows what happened to Blackberry. They are no longer in our yeah, hands. Right. But the whole time I was hoping that that wouldn't happen. Mm, like I was waiting for it to like get better. Yeah, right. And I knew it wouldn't. And I, <laughs> oh, it was just eating at me. It yeah. was such a good movie. It's an hour and 59 minutes. Highly recommend. Which service is, that, is this on? Um, you can watch it. You can rent it on Prime Video. It might still be too close to when it came out to watch for free anywhere. But it's so three, for it. three ninety nine on Prime Video. Garrett definitely paid for yeah. it. I that's not. Is me. he? It's always sunny in Philadelphia fan. Yes. Okay. I feel like that's the hook for a lot of people. Well, they like they like the like dramatic. Sure. Um, yeah. You, you should now watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia because Dennis's character is the most insane. I've seen I've seen oh, Always Sunny. Seen I've started watching it after we started including the clips. Okay. I've seen quite a good bit of it. Okay. Good. Um, Have you seen the, the Dennis system episode? I, don't, I wouldn't know the names of those, but I know I watched the quarantine episode during the main time of COVID quarantine, yeah, and right. that's kind of when I went down that rabbit they hole. They did predict that pretty well. Um, okay. Honorable mention. Wait, I have to do my third one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, not, nothing too sexy, but I've seen this movie, not exaggerating, probably 15 times, but it's been a minute since I had last watched it, and it's super bad. And sometimes I'll check in with these movies just to see if they're still as funny. Because there's been a lot of movies in my life where, like, 10 years goes by. <clears throat> Ace Ventura is one for me. I still appreciate Ace Ventura, but it used to be the the holy grail of movies. It's not that anymore. Super bad. Basically, every line in that movie is a one-liner, and it still moves the plot along. It's just so fucking funny. It, I could sit from start to finish and watch that movie any time of the day without any problem. Fair, easy. Yeah. Um, my honorable mention, it's on Netflix. You need to watch it if you haven't. It's long. It's a time commitment. It's three hours and seven minutes long. Probably out. <laughs> no, you have to. You, okay. watch, you can watch it in bits if you need to. You okay. can also start it and plan to not finish it, and you'll just end up finishing. Okay. It's called RRR, and it is a Indian epic action drama film. Mm. Um. And I don't know how we found it, but it was phenomenal. We've watched it like three times already, and it's really <laughs> long. And the reason why it's on my recent ones is because... Is this Garrett, a comedy? Um, it's an epic action drama film. Okay. It's everything. Uh -huh. We laughed. We cried. We uh, got really on the edge of our seats. Um, Action-packed. And the storyline is fantastic. It's funny. Netflix is saying it's a 66% match for me. It's Some, those things are often wrong, but... <laughs> It's amazing. Um, <laughs> the reason why that's recent is they're going to, Garrett's friend is uh, part of a, well, the groom in an Indian wedding mm. this weekend. Um, and he's like asked all of them to dress in like the appropriate outfits. He's riding in on a horse. Like it is oh, a weekend sick. long event. Yeah. It's this crazy thing. And they want to now watch this um, to get themselves hyped up for it as a rewatch and I'm so in like I, and I don't usually want to dedicate three hours of my life to a movie I'm usually out on that 
Um, I'm so in on this. I love this movie. <laughs> Sweet. I will make an attempt to watch it. I'll show you the trailer when we're done. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, my only honorable mention, this is going a little bit further back, but I'm going to my continue watching list on the Amazon. <clears throat> I remember loving this movie, I think in high school. No, it must have been early college. Nacho Libre, another one that didn't stand the test of time for me. Didn't love it. Yeah. Saw it in theaters never again. Yeah. Okay. Which is too bad because Jack Black is one of my favorite all-time human beings. But yeah. Did uh, you watch it recently? I, just, I got like seven minutes into it and I just went to the next thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was it. Okay. <clears throat> to the five star review yes nice short and sweet uh five stars aging gracefully by the utter episode 193 such a great and informative episode for everyone through hikers and weekend warriors alike big ginger love drink and for reference that was um the episode on hiking the pct in a high snow year with daniel and ed hell yeah uh we love reviews you guys especially the ones that rhyme with hive so if you've got some stars to give our way, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And if it is five stars, we will read it on this podcast. It doesn't matter what it says, mm -hmm. assuming that you can shame us all you want, but we made an exception. You can't shame past guests. Yes. Um, we will read anything the teleprompter says, yeah. so long as the extent of your bullying is with us as the punching bags. Yeah. Um, and we are open to criticism constructive or not in the form of a five-star review um anything under that will just make me cry that's right so also if you're not an apple podcast person i think you can leave uh you can at least rate on spotify i believe i don't think there's any sort of uh contextual reviews but you can also <clears throat> get a hold of us or leave reviews or whatever you want to say via email that's podcast at the track that co Today's sticker code is? Um, when we post this episode on Instagram, in the comment section, tell us what you do with a bag of ticks. And this is prompted from what I would do, which I think would be kind of fun. I think it would be like a Peter-esque art project. You know how when you find a tick, you usually put it in one of those film mm -hmm. rolls, and then you send it to a doctor, and they tell you if it has limes? Tell them you're going to be doing that because you found a tick on you and send them With the bag that. of ticks. <laughs> and just like the look on the doctor's face when he opens that yeah. envelope <laughs> would be priceless. That'd be good. Thank you to our Chuck Norris award winners on Patreon. Actually, let me go to our real list. Stay, say, <laughs> say cool stuff right now. Um, guys, again, the, the brain goes blank when it has to think. <clears throat> and that's a problem. Yeah. I, what else have I watched recently? Okay, you don't have to think about it anymore. Great. List. Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew, Austin McDaniel, Austin Ford, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Brian Allsop, Allsop, Allsop. Allsop labels. Flables. <laughs> Allsop labels. What is uh, Allsop label? Aesop fable. Oh, right. And that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and happy hiking. Bye.